podcastjuice.net. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to the Prince Podcast. My name is Michael Dean, and joining me today, of course, as always, is Mr. Big Sexy and Sax. Sir, how are you doing? Man, I'm fighting this cold off, but it's all good because sometimes you gotta get off the deathbed and make it happen, like like today. Yes, sir. And we have a special guest. That's sort of a joke for me to always say that because we have a lot of great people on here. But let me tell you, we've got somebody on here who is definitely going to give us some great insight. Uh, none other than Miss Susan Rogers. Susan, how are you? I'm really good. How are you? I'm excellent. I'm, I'm feeling real good right now. <laughs> um, so, of course, our listeners, you know who Susan Rogers is. She was an engineer with Prince through what I like to say, uh, you know, the heyday, some of the very important work from the 80s that we all know. Uh, again, for a lot of the longtime listeners of Prince and followers, we lived by those albums and we would open those albums up. And this was back in the day when you had liner notes and those meant so much. And to open that up and say, OK, and all the names that we saw in there, they were like superheroes to us. <laughs> Susan Rogers. Oh, OK. And, and every album you see that that was like, you know, when you read uh, the comic books and it was like the Wonder Woman and the Superman, and, you know, so. Uh, yeah. Susan, thank you for coming on and talking with us today. It is my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. I, I always enjoy talking with other Prince fans. I say other Prince fans because I'm one as well. Wow. So uh, all part of the family. All right. Uh, well, let's let's get into things. And I kind of want to start things uh, a little different. One, I want to get into the question of, you know, of course, you are in uh, recording engineer you come from that background and again we're going to jump around a lot of things but one of the things i wanted to do is to really go into when you first started working with prince or even slightly before that the time when you came from in the 80s this is before pro tools and mm -hmm. digital and all that stuff and so you know i want to if you can explain to the listeners what it was like at that time to be an engineer because I you know I have a little background in this field and I remember things of like uh, Ampex tape uh, right. you know, uh, Quantigy and you know, the quarter inch tape uh, the reel to reel machines and in the, the tracks and everything so can you kind of just explain like what would be the key difference of what they do today and how they record digitally like some people just use a computer versus being in a studio you know traditional recording studio yeah, it's a huge, huge difference. Um, back, uh, I'm going to try and make this brief, but because I'm a college professor, I'm a teacher, so it's hard. No, for take me your to time. Do you? Yeah, take your time. <laughs> um, after World War II, there were a lot of these GIs uh, who could uh, get free education, free or low cost education, and uh, because all these guys came home from the war, and so they they needed jobs. So many of them became radio and television engineers. In the music business, it just started to bloom right around the 50s uh, with the baby boomers and the, the teenagers. And you'd have these on TV, you'd have these dance shows. And so all of a sudden, entertainment folks realized there's a lot of money in popular music. So record labels really started to bloom in the 50s and 60s. And so did recording studios and so did recording technology, which, as you say, included tape. So... Um, a lot of television engineers and radio engineers who were attracted to music got interested in becoming audio recording engineers. So in the 60s, in the early days of uh, the pop, rock, soul movement, in the early 60s, most of the engineers were these, they were real engineers. They had a background in uh, audio electronics. And uh, they were, sometimes people use the word nerd as a pejorative, but I love, I love your basic nerds. So <laughs> a nerd is, is like a compliment in my world, but these were your good nerds. These were your, your guys, and they were usually all men, mm -hmm. who, who really uh, were 
more attracted to the technology than they were music making. But as the golden era of rock and roll and pop and soul came up through the 60s and 70s, music kind of branched off and became a little bit of an outlaw profession. So our cousins who were in film and television and radio, a lot of those audio engineers were part of a union and they worked kind of nine to five jobs. But the music making engineers, we were the outlaws. We were the people who ran away and joined the circus in a sense, because these are the folks who went on the road and did live sound for front of house. And as you know, in the golden era of rock and roll, it was, well, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Right. It's the kind of place where you could go to a studio and you could do drugs and all sorts of, of debauchery and things could happen while you were at work. <laughs> this <laughs> was the kind of profession then that attracted um, engineering types who both loved music, loved the idea of, um, of being in, in a music-making environment that wouldn't necessarily give you this great job security, but would be fun and would let you be a kid for life. So um, that attracted a lot of us. Uh, someone like me, I was a person who I wasn't interested in the, the debauchery of it all. I was really interested in, in music. I wanted to make records. I, I'm not a musician. I, 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 I never saw myself as a star. I saw myself as really just kind of wanting to help. So there were a lot of engineers who were that type. We were the, we were the studious engineering nerd-minded folks but we loved music and we wanted to make a contribution so when I started it was 1978 and that's when um, that's when one era the era of the big rock bands was giving away to make room for the new wave artists uh, that's what was happening in the in the punk scene, the pop punk scene, but simultaneously what was starting to happen out of New York was hip hop. Mm -hmm. And that's when the folks like Hank Shockley and some of these other people, Cool Herc and some of these folks, were imagining that music could be something different, that you could use a new technology. In their case, it was turntables. So anyway, uh, 1978 was kind of a, a, the edge of out with the old, in with the new. Um, I and, and folks I knew, we worked primarily with, uh, with tape, but we also worked with drum machines, and drum machines were brand new right around then. In the early 80s, there were a lot of drummers who were really scared that they were going to get replaced because drum machines are here now, and uh, there were horn players and string players who thought, oh, no, we're never going to work again because now we've got horns and strings and drums in a box. Uh, folks like Prince were making music using the new technology, of synthesizers and samplers and drum machines, but also using the old technology of having musicians on stage. It was a really exciting time. Um, another thing that maybe your young audience might not really understand is back in the old days, there was a not a velvet rope, it was a giant wall that separated those people who made music professionally from those who didn't. So in order to get into a recording studio, recording studios were so expensive, you pretty much had to have a record deal. Mm -hmm. So by the time you got into the studio, which it would cost you a cheap studio would be $600 a day. And the more expensive ones in the 80s were you know, 2000 bucks a day. In order to have that kind of money, you needed to be signed to a record deal. Right. In order to be signed to a record deal, you needed to have played on stage locally. You needed to have had a fan base. You needed to have honed your craft of your original songs and your stage presence in front of an audience before you ever got a deal. And then after you got a deal, then you'd get in the studio. Today's record makers don't need a record deal to make a record. All they need is, as you said earlier, a laptop. If you've got a laptop, even an iPad, mm -hmm. you can have a studio at home or in your bedroom. So it's a very different world today, and technology is what made that world possible. That's excellent. What, and you, you spoke on a lot of different things, and, and it's interesting, like, I sort of take a parallel between sort of the environment of, uh, you, you call it the nerd, the music head. It's almost the same you see today. That guy would probably be the programmer 
person, yeah. maybe, you know what I'm saying? And, and want to really be into to crunching numbers and figuring out how to make something. And yeah. they, it's this very sort of like niche, cool thing, but it's an insider sort of thing. And that's how I kind of think about when, what you're saying. But you, you just touched on something in terms of you had to be, yeah, the barrier to entry was incredibly high, right? Uh, yeah. Can you talk to me and we'll, we'll shift into Prince, but like getting into the studio, because I remember, you know, early times I got into a studio situation and I didn't have any equipment, but I had some money. Um, yeah. And it was like, well, I can do I can't really do any pre-production at home because I don't have much. I had a turntable when I was doing some hip hop stuff, but it was like, well, let's go into the studio and we're just going to dump money in and sort of like learn our way as we go. But uh-huh. uh, when you talk about uh, sort of the differences of how you can get into it, can you speak a little bit in terms of like how an artist had to, um, I'm trying to say, really had to know what you were doing before you got in that studio uh, in terms of like, well, you already, like you, said, you already had to know how to play the music. But you couldn't be going in there and just sort of like diddling around like you you had to kind of go in there and like, yeah, this is you already know how to play your instrument. You know, you kind of know you have to know what you want to do as opposed to now. Like you don't there's probably not that sort of seasoned talent and already sort of been pressured into like being good because you're sort of just figuring out as you're going along. I mean, I don't know if I'm making any sense, but is there a difference? I think I know what you're talking about. You're talking about uh, what is what is the barrier to entry? What is what is your ticket? What what sort of ticket do you need to get past that? I said it wasn't a velvet rope to get over that wall to get on the other side, and it depends on what it was you wanted to do. In order to be an assistant engineer, for example. Um, All you have to do today and then back then as well, all you had to do to be an assistant engineer was basically just want to be one. Mm -hmm. You'd show up at the studio and they might hire you as an intern or that would be your entry level job. You'd be the only responsibilities you have would be sweeping the floor, cleaning up the bathrooms, making the coffee. And then uh, you'd be the person that they'd call at four o'clock in the morning if they needed you to come and lock up, you know, that kind of thing. And then you would earn your you'd earn just some credibility and they teach you a few things along the way and you really would learn on the job and and many many engineers if not well certainly most of them came up that way they didn't really have any formal training they learned on the job starting as an intern if you're going to be a maintenance technician and repair the equipment like I was I had to have some background in in electronics I did not come from a family that had any money so there was college was just out of the question it just wasn't mm. going to happen um, but I, as long as you can afford the book, that's all you need, and and that's what I did. I w- I would buy the I bought the electronics books, and I taught myself electronics just by buying the textbooks and reading them and teaching myself. So a lot of people did did things like that. The barrier to entry was, um, are you willing to? Can you learn these things? And I think it's the same thing with a musical instrument as well. Um, you can play a little bit. And you can get in on a session. Session musicians are a special breed. The session musicians who are in the union, those people can really play. And in order to become a session musician, what you have to do is is you have to be able to deliver on anybody's record under any sorts of circumstances. So those are the people really know how to play, whether they learn formally or they learn just by self-taught, they're, they're people who know a variety of musical styles and they can really play. But then we've got another category, and that's that category of young kid who's just really creative and may not have had any formal training, Prince didn't have formal training, but is just so driven to make music that they'll come into the studio armed with perhaps the most important variable of all which is just creativity they just they'll have new ideas um that is one of the tickets that can get you into a studio and into this line of work we had uh, the great hank shockley come and visit us at berkeley uh this past year and he's just been a hero of mine for the longest time and he talked about his how public enemy started and what it was like um he met he met Chuck D when they were both in college at Adelphi, and he talked about that meeting. And what 
what Hank was doing back then is just playing house parties, just getting turntables and hooking up two turntables and running them through an amp and just getting kids to dance and collecting money from them so he'd have uh, so he'd have pocket money. You know, it was just his his great strength was he understood what music people wanted in an entertainment setting. What what music do kids want to dance to? So um, you gotta bring something to the party when you are embarking on a career as a record maker, but it's different. Um, there, there are many, many different things you can bring. Uh, mm-hmm. I advise young people to just find the thing that you do best and then do that. Build that muscle. Whatever it is that's good about you. Don't try to do everything because we live in a collaborative world. Just be really, 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 really good at what you do mm-hmm. and partner up with people who do other things well. All right. Um, so let's what, what were you doing before you got introduced into the Prince world and sort of transition? Like, how did that introduction happen? Now, right before Prince, I was working as the studio maintenance tech for Crosby, Stills and Nash in Hollywood. I was with them for about two and a half, three years. And the maintenance tech is the person who repairs the equipment. Um, my first job was right before Crosby, Stills and Nash. It was a company called Audio Industries Corporation. They were in Hollywood, right across the street from A and M Records, and uh, they sold and serviced MCI consoles and tape machines. So I started with them as a trainee in 1978, and uh, I, I was, you know, wiring up studios, and I learned to become a service tech and repair tape machines and consoles. Um, Crosby, Stills, and Nash were right up the street, and their studio had equipment that would break down a lot. So they begged me uh, uh, to come and work for them. Uh, they kept asking, come on, don't you want to come and work for us? And eventually I said yes, and that was uh, that was my first real studio job. But I was a big Prince fan. I've been a Prince fan since since I first heard him on um on the radio in in Los Angeles when I was when I was young, there were two soul radio stations, and one was K A C E, and one was uh, K J L H. Uh, I don't know if those stations are still there, but K J L H was Kindness, Joy, Love, and Happiness. It's owned by Stevie Wonder, wow. and yep, then you could hear you hear a lot of great stuff in the late seventies and early eighties, and that's where I first heard Prince. So I kind of had dreamed that if I were to get my fantasy job, it would be to go to work for Prince. And then one day in 1983, I heard through Westlake Audio. Westlake Audio is a pro audio company in Los Angeles. And I heard through that grapevine that Prince was looking for a technician. So I just thought, well, then his search is over because that is my (laughs) job. I am getting my job. I knew he liked working with women. I was uh, qualified. And at this point, I'd been at it about five years. So I had enough experience. I was still young. I was 26 years old. But I had enough experience that uh, I could handle the gig. And so his management interviewed me. And they said, all right, you'll do. And I packed up and moved to Minneapolis in uh, 1983. And this was he was just coming off the 1999 tour, okay. and he was prepping for the movie and the Purple Rain album. So I joined him just then, that summer. What was your first meeting like with Prince? Did you meet him in the studio for the first time? Yeah, he had uh, the home on Kiowa Trail that um, was on Kiowa Trail in Chanhassen, and uh, it, it was a nice split level family home. And down in the in the in the basement level were two bedrooms. There was the master bedroom, his his bedroom, and just across the hallway from his bedroom was a smaller bedroom that he had converted into a studio. Uh, just It's really just a control room. Um, but his console and tape machine and his instruments were in there, and these massive, massive Westlake monitors that he loved so much. Uh, and the first gig that I had to do when I became his employee, the first thing I had to do was pull out this old console that he had in that bedroom and install a new console that he had just bought from Westlake Audio. So that took me about a week. So while I was downstairs every day, and I worked long, long days just all by myself, pulling out all this wiring, putting in the new wiring, testing everything, repairing his tape machine, right above me was the kitchen, the kitchen, dining room, living room area. And the piano, his piano was right there where the dining room met the living room. It was right above me. So I could hear him playing all the pieces of music that would go into the Purple Rain album. 
he was just waiting for me to be done, you know, so he could get back to recording. And I could hear him taking meetings with the time and with Vanity Six and with his band. And I could hear him watching videos. I didn't see much of him, but he was just upstairs while I was downstairs getting all this work done. Um, I had been told, you know, don't bother him, let him work. And if he needs you, he'll come and find you. So after about a week of my getting all this done, I was finally finished. And I called Sandy Scipioni, who was, who was Prince's kind of girl Friday. I called her and I said, Sandy, I'm done. What do I do? You know, can you let him know I'm done? She says, okay, I'll, I'll call him and I'll let him know. So he takes the phone call upstairs and then he came downstairs to see me. And this is when we finally had our first face-to-face -face meeting. And he just, he was very... He was kind of brusque. He didn't make any introduction. He just came downstairs and he asked me some questions and he said, did you do this, 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 and this? And then he said, okay, well, we're not going to uh, uh, get started tonight, but uh, come back at such and such a time tomorrow morning. And then he turned around to leave, to go back upstairs. And I was thinking to myself, this feels a little bit weird. He, doesn't, he hasn't even asked me my name. And I just moved 2,300 miles leaving everyone I've ever known. I'd never been out of California before. I, you know, I, I just took this gig, and I something said to me, don't let it start like this. So he turned around to walk away, and I just stopped him, and I said, Prince. He turned back around, and I just, I just stuck out my hand to shake hands with him, and I said, I'm Susan Rogers. I looked at him in the face like, you know, can we at least start like this? And he got... Um, this look on his face that I, in time, would become very familiar with. It was this look like he wanted to laugh, <laughs> but it probably would have been rude to laugh. So he gets this kind of, he's amused, but he's going to like, you know, he understands how formal this is. And he says, well, I'm Prince. And he stuck his hand out, and then we shook hands and kind of bowed very formally. And it was, <laughs> okay, very good. And something inside made me think, okay, good. That, that, that was good. That was a good way to start. I, I wanted to establish, like, come on, you're you and I'm me, and we're going to be working together, and let's let it be understood that um, essentially we're human first, right. and then we'll take it from there. I'm, I'm glad I did that. Uh, that worked out well for me. That's interesting. What? Um, and so this was in 83... Mm -hmm. And you said he's. You can hear him sort of rehearsing or playing some of the music for Purple Rain. Uh, when did you first do some recording with him? Because my understanding is, he, did he also have some sort of warehouse set up as well, or did that come later? Yeah, we had uh, right around then. In uh, there was a suburb, St. Louis Park, and in that in that little suburb is where his warehouse was. And the warehouse was really just for live rehearsals with the band. And it was, it was a warehouse. It was a single floor warehouse. And there were big, um, like, designers cutting tables there were a couple of folks who worked for him who made his clothes. They worked out of there and uh, it's where the band rehearsed. So he had his rehearsal space and then he also had a, a studio in his home. And as long as I worked for him, he always had both. He always had the warehouse, which eventually the idea for that, it became Paisley Park, and then he always had a home studio. So, yeah, the very first thing I did for him, the first tape he had me put up was Darling Nikki. Hmm. And, he, and he hired me as his maintenance tech, but he didn't really either, he either didn't know or he didn't care that there's a difference between a maintenance tech and a recording engineer. A recording engineer is kind of an artist who uses the equipment. A maintenance tech just installs and repairs it. So he hired me as a tech, but he put me in the engineering seat from that very first day. And he had me put up Darling Nikki and get a rough mix on it. And uh, he had me set up a vocal mic and and I was thinking, this is great. <laughs> it really was. Literally, it was a dream come true. Now, it's interesting. So we're, we're getting into this Purple Rain material. And at this point already, Prince has a very distinctive sound, uh, not just from the playing style, but from the mix and the way they would EQ drums and things of that nature. Is he introducing you to say, hey, I want, you know, the snares to be like this or I want a gate on this track or something? Or, or did you bring some of that to him? I'm just curious to like, how did you acclimate yourself to what his sensibility or what he wanted it to sound like? 
Um, it's a great question. I knew what his sound was because I had listened to, I had all of his records and I had seen him live uh, a couple of times before I went to work for him. So I knew his sound. The problem was I didn't know how to get it. And Prince wasn't the kind of person who would tell you. You had to just sort of know. But the person who came to my rescue was Jesse Johnson, Jesse from the time. Ah. Um, right around this time, um, it was late summer, Prince needed to take a lot of meetings out in Los Angeles concerning the upcoming movie. So Prince was out of town and he let Jesse use the studio, his home studio that week. And Jesse and I worked together that, it would have been like September, I think, except maybe October. And Jesse was so sweet. He took me under his wing and he showed me a lot. He he showed me on the console. This is how Prince likes his kick drum. The hi-hat is always panned to the left. Rhythm guitar is on the left. He, he showed me okay. toms go left to right, not right to left, high to low, like you're reading a book. And he just showed me this is what Prince likes. And, um, and um, I'll always be grateful to Jesse for that. By the time Prince got back from L.A., uh, I had a good understanding of what he was looking for. Wow. Now, did, did Jesse end up inheriting that uh, one of the Prince's boards or something? I'm kind of just jumping off. but uh. Yeah, I think he did. Uh, Prince was unhappy with one of the consoles that he had, and uh, Jesse liked it. So I think Jesse bought it from him. It ended up over in Jesse's house. Now, bringing Jesse into the and I'm a huge Jesse Johnson fan as well. Mm -hmm. What... What was sort of the real working relationship in terms of, because at this point I'm imagining there's Purple Rain uh, music, there's the Time Ice Cream Castle uh, mm -hmm. stuff going on, there's Vanity, uh, not Vanity, Apollonia 6, mm -hmm. and I would assume maybe some Sheila uh, coming in, into play in terms of music. But in terms of like Morris, Jesse, and Prince, was there ever... Uh, were you around in those sessions when they were working on the music for Ice Cream Castles? Was it just uh -huh. Prince or was it was Jesse in there or was Morris in there? Can you give us a little info on that? The way all of Prince's alter ego bands worked, uh, whether it was Jill Jones, Sheila E., mm -hmm. The Time, mm -hmm. Vanity Six, Apollonia Six, the way those bands worked were as follows. Prince would record tracks for them, and he would record all the all the instruments, unless he brought in like Eric Leeds to do horns or something like that. Pretty much, it was all Prince, uh, and he would record a guide vocal. Then he would turn the tape over to Morris if it was for the time, or he'd turn it over to, to he'd turn it over to me to do the vocals with uh, Apollonia or. Uh, he might turn it over to Jill Jones and uh, David Rivkin, for example, to finish the Jill Jones record. So the singer would come in and then sing and match Prince's vocals line by line. Um, so in, in, in the case of the time, Prince would leave guitar solo space available for Jesse, because Jesse was a very different kind of guitar player from Prince. So Prince would certainly not lay down a Prince guitar part for Jesse to follow. Hmm. Jesse would his own parts on there but for the most part all the keyboard parts and everything else was all prints and then the band's job was just to be the live version mm -hmm. of this alter ego morris did his own vocals of course but uh, that was after prince would lay a guide vocal down so essentially and i ask this because you know a lot of us have heard prince's sort of versions of, of some of these songs he's given to Prodigy artist, but we've never heard. I, I've never heard any of the recordings of his time stuff, and so I always ask the question: that sort of the caricature of Morris Day is that essentially that's like that's that Jamie Star Prince. You kind of hear him do sort of a comical sort of voice sometimes in, in in things, but is he essentially doing all of this sort of mannerisms vocally that Morris? does on these songs or does yes interesting yes <laughs> yeah prince had that voice he had that alter ego mm -hmm. that was um the character that you see of morris um I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna go ahead and say this because i think there's plenty of evidence that it's true the character that you see of morris was an alter ego of prince how that alter ego of prince developed however i I feel pretty confident in saying that that character 
came from Morris originally. Mm. If you recall, Prince and Morris knew each other in high school. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think this character kind of developed as, um, it was one aspect of Morris's personality. I think it, it certainly had to have been an aspect of Prince's personality as well. And I think it was just kind of a guy that was common among the two of them. So when Prince would do that voice, and he'd do it in the studio all the time, um, when he was being funny or when he was in a good mood, that side of him, the Morris side of him, would come out. So I think it might be safe to say that the character was part Morris and it was part Prince. When Prince did the guy vocals on those time tracks, the mannerisms were the mannerisms that, that Morris used but morris added his own spin to that okay wow. and i think i think i think the same is true with vanity six i think uh prince and vanity had a very successful um artistic collaboration because each of them recognized a kindred spirit in the other vanity was um in many ways uh, a female version of prince i think um uh, she was in in many ways kind of an ideal woman it's not perfect overlap for sure but um, they had a lot in common. Interesting. So, Purple Rain. Um, you know what's interesting about the Purple Rain album to me? I didn't know this at the time, but you know, obviously learning about it over the years is that it's almost. And you can you're the person to ask, but it's essentially almost part of his like a live album. Would that be fair to say? Like some of those tracks originate from a concert. And then you know, you know, bring them back into the studio, I guess, and sort of touch them up a little bit. But what was that like? Had you had ever recorded a live uh, performance before of that nature prior to doing this? No, I hadn't. Um, and I didn't do that original recording. That original oh. recording took place August 3rd, 1983. And that just happened to have been my birthday. I had been hired by Prince, but I was back in Los Angeles just packing up. So I had just signed the contract. Oh, okay. And that, that recording at First Avenue was done by David Z, um, mm -hmm. Bobby Z's brother. David Rivkin. Uh, when I arrived a little bit later, like a week afterward, I suppose, um, I worked on those tapes and I did a lot of the overdubs that became the Purple Rain record. And not all of those bed tracks were done live. Darling Nikki, for example, was just straight up out of the studio. Mm -hmm. um, so the live recordings, virtually all the recordings that I did with Prince were um, it was my first time experiencing that kind of stuff. I, I knew how the equipment worked. I knew it like the back of my hand. But yeah, this was this is the first time for me. The, when you listen to the Purple Rain album, as I did recently, uh, one of the astonishing things is to realize this is essentially all one guy. This is one guy. There's some other players on it. Uh, you know, Brown Mark is on bass on some of those tracks, uh, on the live tracks anyway, like I Would Die For You and Baby I'm a Star, and, and Matt Fink and Lisa and Wendy are on some of those tracks. But so much of it is just this one guy, and he would have been 24 years old at the time. Wow. Uh, and a remarkable, remarkable accomplishment, really remarkable. Yeah, that, that, that album is amazing. And, you know, I think for us as fans, we take that album for granted because for a lot of us, that was the entry point. And we've, it's been, we've listened to it so much. And, you know, it's such a high water mark in the career. But, you know, I think, you know, I know they've been talking about doing an anniversary, uh, you know, special edition sort of release of that. But I think it's when you get into songs like uh, Computer Blue. Now, you know, there's the version that's on the album and then there's sort of, you know, there's the unreleased version that is a whole other animal to me. Like mm -hmm. uh, when you guys. So when you, I'm curious for what you remember, were a lot of those songs edited down? And what I mean is like the prior albums of Prince, the songs would run long, like, you know, Controversy, you know, 1999, some of the tracks in there, you almost felt like you got the entire songs. But with Purple Rain, it was like, it seemed like it was a concerted, concerted effort to like, let's make these sort of singles or something. And, and like, you can, you know, let's edit, the, you know, uh, let's go crazy, right? The version that's on the album versus that 12 inch version. 
yeah. you know, amazing. So were, were some of the songs chopped down? And do you know some of the reasonings behind that? If they, you know, if they were, yeah. Yeah, uh, this will be hard for your younger listeners to actually wrap their heads around. But remember, uh, the older listeners know this, it, when, when we had vinyl records, you could get at most 17 and a half, maybe 18 minutes at most on a side. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to put four songs or five songs on a side of vinyl, uh, you could, they just simply couldn't be that long. So the general rule was with Prince, back in those days anyway, if it was a dance song, the original track was always pretty long so that we could have a 12-inch version of it. And just because it feels good. It feels good. If you've got a good group going, he would have songs that would be 6, 8, 10, 12 minutes long. But to make that work on an album, in the sequence of an album, you have to cut it down. So, um, yeah, we, we would sometimes... Um, do a long version of a track and then realize, oh, this track is coming together so well, it's probably going to be a single. Um, we would start editing it right away. So sometimes I'd edit the multi-track and take a long version of a song that might be, maybe its original track was seven or eight minutes long, and we'll just go ahead and we'll cut it down to about four minutes because we know that this is going to be important on the album. But more often than not, he would overdub the entire full length of the song. We would print the long version onto two track and then cut it down as we sequenced an album side okay. um so that's that, that's how, how things typically went um songs that were recorded at rehearsal tend to be especially long like for example possessed mm. was recorded at rehearsal and um Let's Go Crazy was recorded at the warehouse at rehearsal. So this is a band jamming and it feels good and he's going to keep that thing going. He's going to keep tape rolling and then uh, afterward we'll cut it down, cut it down later. Now, this, this was different for ballads. Um, I don't think, I don't recall that the original version of When Doves Cry, I don't think it was especially long. And uh, certainly songs like Adore, uh, love songs and ballads are going to, they're going to be shorter. The dance stuff will be longer. Wow. Okay. Um, this, you brought up something in terms of the live band recording in the studio. Uh, and I think you've answered this before, but I just want to be clear. The Let's Go Crazy performance that is, you know, that's on the album, the 12-inch, whatever, that is a live band recording, correct? Yes. Now, do you remember, like, how many takes it had? Did they, had, did they like, rehearse it a couple times and then... You know, we got it, or did he had to kind of go back a few times and punch things in, or? Yeah, his band was so good, and Prince was an old-fashioned band leader, real old-fashioned band leader, like a James Brown or Count Basie or someone like that. When he was in front of his band, he was so happy. I mean, <laughs> the sound checks that we did on tour were four hours long. Most bands, when they sound check, you know, they get up there for 15, 20 minutes just to make sure everything's working. They'll make a few adjustments and then they're off the stage. If Prince could have a band around him and an instrument in his hand and a mic in front of him, he's happy. So um, we would record Let's Go Crazy after they had the arrangement down. So he, as I recall, um, Let's Go Crazy was done, I, I do remember for a fact that it was done in the evening, because most of our work was, was done in the evening, but um, he would have worked with the band, arranging parts right there, you know, try this, Lisa, try that, Matt, Wendy, why don't you do this, let's break it down here. I don't remember if he came in with the lyrics written, or if he got that groove going first, and then stopped and added the lyrics. With him, it was kind of 50-50. Sometimes he started a song on piano at home, and then he came into the studio, and, and the melody and the chord changes and the lyrics are already written. And uh, usually with dance songs, he'd do the groove first, and then he'd stop halfway through, get a cassette of it, listen to the cassette, write the lyrics, and then resume, add a vocal, and then and add everything else. I don't remember where in the chain the lyrics for Let's Go Crazy came along, but I remember that after we had that basic track, the whole band went home, and then just the two of us stayed at the warehouse recording the overdubs, uh, the guitar solo and the lead vocal and all that. So that, that brings a question. Uh, I assume, there's is there a control room in this warehouse, or is it just a big open space? No, just a big open space. <laughs> so so, he's yeah. doing, so you actually saw him do vocals then? 
or did yeah, you? Yeah, right in front of him. Okay. Yeah. Was that a no, uh, not a normal thing? Was did you normally had to if you're in the studio you had to leave the room when he's oh, doing? Oh yeah, it, it was it was so he was so Prince was so extraordinary because Prince did not care what the rules were, and in in classical engineering you're going to want to have the open microphones on in one room, mm -hmm. which is what we called the studio, and then on the other side of the glass is the control room. And uh, that's so that the engineer can do critical listening in a separate room from where the acoustics are actually happening. So the engineer is in the, in the control room and he can solo things and he can turn the volume down or crank it and you know whatever it is you need to do. But with Prince, he just didn't care about that kind of stuff. So what we did is at, at, at rehearsal, all the mics that were on this stage fed a splitter snake and the splitter snake was just a way of taking a one microphone signal and sending it to two different destinations so it came out of the splitter snake and it went to the monitor mix console so that the band could um, have a feed that allowed them to hear themselves in the monitors and then the other half of that split went to my recording console and i had a tape machine just right there so the only control room was just wherever this big square of carpet was laid down in the middle of this cement floor <laughs> all right well let's just put the console here let's put the tape machine here and roll up some outboard gear and let's work so my console was just a few feet away from cubby's monitor mix console cubby is rob colby who's now one of the greatest live sound engineers in the world so cubby and i would have our consoles right there and we would just be a few feet away from prince and the band and and that's where they would record uh broke all the rules but it was great how, how would you would you track everything individually like were the drums you know snare here kick on this one or did you just kind of were they you know kind of cobbled together on tracks i'm just curious like on a live yeah, it, Prince in those days only went 24 track. He never synchronized two tape machines together so he could go 48 track. Now this would also it blows the mind of the young generation who are used to Pro Tools and they're used to a limitless, right. for all intents and purposes, number of tracks. But we were limited to 24 tracks. So essentially, um, what, the way it always went was track one would be claps, two was kick drum, three was snare, four was hi-hat, and then uh, five and six would either be toms and overheads, or sometimes it would be claps, kick, snare, and then uh, on tracks four and five, it would just be the mix coming out of the drum machine of the hi-hat and uh, all the other stuff that he wanted, all you know, hi-hat toms and just anything else that came out of the drum machine that ran through his pedal board. His guitar pedal board was the kind made by um, Roland, the Roland Boss pedals. So the output of his drum machine would run through these guitar pedals, and that included the flanger and the chorus and the delay and the overdrive and the octaver and all those cool sounds that he got out of a drum machine came right out of those those Boss guitar pedals that you can still buy at, um, at Guitar Center today. Okay. So that was just the first few tracks. And then it would be bass, and we would make the decision on the spot if it was going to be the bass direct or did we want the amp sound. That would all be combined onto one track. And then uh, a few tracks for guitars and keyboards. Uh, he only needed one track for his lead vocal because he didn't he didn't do multiple passes. When he did his vocal track, he uh, he needed to work alone when he did his vocal track, except for the live recordings, of course, or the warehouse recordings. But for the most part, we'd lay down all half the instruments, let's say. Then I'd set up a vocal mic for him, and I'd leave the room and patch his vocal chain into the track that he was going to use and arm the tape machine. Let's just say it's track 16. Gotcha. Then he would run the machine. He'd have the remote on his right side and the microphone right in front of him, and he would run the machine to sing the vocal track. And if he made a mistake, he'd just roll back and punch himself in. When he was done with the vocal track, his lead vocal, uh, then he'd call me in and we'd do the backing vocals, and then we'd finish up the track. Now, while he's playing all his instruments and coming up with the timbres he's going to use, the arrangement that he wants, while he's working on his instrumental patches, I'd be working on the mix and dialing in sounds and reverbs and delays and patching new stuff in and tweaking the limiters and the compressors. And So by the time he was done overdubbing, we didn't need to make too many tweaks before we could go ahead and print the mix. That's something I wanted to ask you about. So 
it, let's imagine you guys are working all night and he's you know doing his vocals and stuff. Are you guys walking out of the studio with a final mix or is that just a mixed enough that he can listen to it in the car or something like that? That's a good question. Um, for the most part, he didn't like to ever go back to a song. Mm. Uh, if he was barely satisfied with it, that ended up being the canonical version, the version that, that we know. The only time he would go back is when he was really unsure of the arrangement of the song, the treatment of it. He, he rarely went back to mix something. So for the most part, at the end of the day, and that's why our days were typically 24 hours long, uh, when we printed a mix, it was done. That, that's the end of that. Um, but sometimes he'd go back and he'd want to rework the song. And there was some that spring to mind were Strange Relationship. It took a lot of reworking. It was unusual. He really played with Strange Relationship, with the tempo and how he wanted it to feel. Um, songs like Possessed, that was another example, ran it through a number of different tempo changes. And um, You Got the Look was a, 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 a unique example in that he changed it a lot, but he actually changed it a lot over the course of one massively long two-day session. We were at Sunset Sound and it was Thanksgiving, and uh, we worked all that Thursday and all Friday. And I think we probably wrapped it up at some point on Saturday because it went through so many changes. Wow, <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ah, well, there's so much. Um, here, let me ask you this, because this is a question that, so we asked our, some of our listeners if they had some questions for you. Now, they gave us so many questions that we're not going to be able to get to all of them. But one of the main ones that came through, and this is a question I have as well, because I love this song. <laughs> now, the mm -hmm. song I want to ask you about is Adonis and Bathsheba. You, oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Obviously, you worked with Prince, uh, engineered this song, but my understanding is that you didn't really care for this song or something. Oh, so, no. <laughs> <laughs> you got to clear this up for us. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I said before, uh, I came in to work for him as a fan, and I got to tell you, I was with him for over four years, and every <laughs> single day with every new song, I had this feeling of gratitude and amazement and excitement for every new song. I don't know if I was just easily impressed, uh, that's part of it, but the other part of it, the guy was so great that every time he'd do something new, I'd be thinking, this might be the greatest thing he's ever done. I think this is the best, I can't wait. It's gonna be great when the fans get to hear this. This is fantastic, I love this song. I always felt that way no matter how exhausted i was when he said the two magic words fresh tape it meant you know we're gonna keep going uh, it might be after 24 or 48 hours or even more he'd say fresh tape and i was always excited because it meant oh another song <laughs> and uh i was so excited but adonis and Bathsheba was the first time and this was at the end of four years where i thought to myself you know, I don't think this is one of his best ones. <laughs> uh. <laughs> and there, there was it just there was something funny about it. And I thought the lyric was kind of corny. And it was Adonis and Bathsheba in a garden of love. And at one point, he was overdubbing this harp, just this little bling. <laughs> and I started to laugh. I just thought it was funny. And I, I, I think I seem to remember that he gave me a dirty look or said something kind of snarky about it. But I couldn't help it. I, I thought it was funny. Wow. That one always it just stood out for me, but it took that long for me to get to that point. Uh, okay, I, I can understand that. I, when I first heard that song, I, my jaw dropped because I was just like, you know, with a lot of these songs, I'm like, how come this didn't come out? I'm like, ah. I know, I know. <laughs> I, I had the same feeling. It would break my heart because sometimes when we would be sequencing albums, he would put on songs that I loved and I'd be so excited about, and then he'd change his mind and he'd have me pull it. Wow. And I realized it's not going to make the record. The The single most heartbreaking one was for me, uh, Moonbeam Levels. Okay. Uh, I didn't record that. He recorded it before I arrived, but I absolutely loved it. And so many times we would put Moonbeam Levels into the sequence, and then he would take it off. Uh, that was disappointing. Hmm. 
What uh, so speaking of of other recordings, what do you remember? Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, Roadhouse Garden mm. um, because I know there's um, there's a great uh, live performance. I think it was his birthday, mm-hmm. uh, and it, you know it's out there. And during that show, they do Roadhouse Garden. Uh, actually, they, I'm sorry, they do uh, what's the song? Is it For Destiny or something like that? Our, Our Destiny. Destiny. Our Destiny. Excuse Our me. Destiny. And then they go in the Roadhouse Garden. And looking at the date of that show, I believe that show was before when uh, before Purple Rain had came out. Yeah. And so you can kind of hear like, whoa, was there a whole nother sort of project that? could have been put out there and i've heard talks about roadhouse garden but what do you remember was that an actual album uh was that something that you guys had sort of planned on doing or what happened with that project he was on fire at that (laughs) time in his life this was um it was a birthday show it was june 7th 1984 and uh he was on the edge of a whole new chapter in his career. So at the date of that show, he was about one month away from releasing the Purple Rain album and about six weeks away from the movie coming out. Now, right around that time, when there's that much energy in the air, that fuels a big writing spree. So there was a lot of writing that was going on at that time. That's when he he just was pouring out songs were just pouring out of him and that included our destiny and roadhouse garden and uh, just so many other tracks that the band would work on at rehearsal at that time he had a new band member he had wendy who he was going to be really introducing on the world scale when we embarked on this big long tour and uh, it was just very inspiring for him a lot of things had kind of come together uh he didn't know how the movie was going to be received he didn't know how the album would be received Uh, it could have made or broken his career, but he was feeling really optimistic. So that um, package of stuff was just um, just another of the many, many titles that he could afford to throw away. The stuff that he didn't release, if you compiled all that, all of his unreleased material together, it could be one of the great all-time careers yeah. <laughs> for another artist. Like, he, he, he was so prolific. Um, Our Destiny and Roadhouse Garden, to the best of my recollection, were never cut together into an album. So we had already sequenced, we already sequenced Purple Rain. In order to release an album in, uh, this Purple Rain was released in late June, which means it has to be delivered to Warner Brothers months ahead of that. It went to, it went to Warner Brothers in the spring because you have to get that record at that time. You have to, you have to have it mastered and it has to go to a manufacturing plant mm-hmm. that's going to stamp out all this vinyl. So the door had closed on putting anything new on the Purple Rain album, but Prince was still writing like crazy. So there was just a lot of stuff that they played for fun live and, uh, and he enjoyed. But by the time he got to Around the World a Day, a year later, uh, he was no longer in that mood. So that's what happened to most of the stuff that was in the vault. He he just didn't get to it in time. So it ended up in the vault. Wow. Um, sort of last question in this period for a second. Uh, the time. Uh, there's, a, there's another uh, performance that the time did at uh, First Avenue. Uh, and I think that some of their... This performance was pulled for the movie or their album. But I wanted to ask you, did you work on that show, if you know what I'm talking about? It was, uh, I think it was the last show that Morris did. Uh, yeah, I, I was there. Um, it seemed like there was a funny vibe with Morris. <laughs> like maybe he does this thing in the, in the middle. It's like a sermon sort of thing. And it seemed like he was kind of uh, throwing a little, nah, I had no way of knowing, he's throwing some slick jabs at Prince. Yeah. A little bit in that. What, what was going on in that period? That's really tough. And I, I, I can answer what was going on in two words, which is just human nature. You know, it, it, uh, when Prince was building an empire, and it, it, it was an empire, it was making a lot of money for a lot of people. And Prince was such a, an extraordinary genius that, as I said earlier, you could have taken him and divided him up, and you could have gotten five great careers out of this one guy. So what Prince asked of Vanity Six, and what he asked of the members of the time, in particular Morris, he asked these artists to be 
an alternate version of himself. Prince was the first person that I'm aware of to ever create his own competition. He created the time and he created Vanity Six because Prince was just one guy out of North Minneapolis. And if you've got one artist coming out of, let's take Bob Dylan coming out of Hibbing, Minnesota, that's just a point. But if you've got several data points, when you have several data points, now you've got a direction. So it was smart of Prince to realize that if he created his own competition, he'd be creating a scene and he would be able to place himself in a scene, which is a bigger deal than just standing out on your own. And others have followed him, Jay-Z and and, uh, others have followed by creating empires of their own, Mm. by creating alternate versions of themselves. So anyway, what Prince is asking for Morris at the at this time is to is to be a version of Prince, and who wants to do that? Like Morris is intelligent and creative and an artist in his own right, and he's looking at the proposition of, hey, don't be yourself, be this alternate version of me. Um, that doesn't really work. Uh, it might work for a time, and people will agree to it for a time, but. It's it's hard to agree to it forever, and and there, that that tension, which is just human nature, was reaching its peak right at that mm. point. Wow, and and I, I want to come back to around the other day, but uh, I remember listening to the family and the song Mutiny, and you know when I really really listened to some of the stuff, you can hi- kind of hear Prince saying toward the end of that song it sounds like he he was actually saying the things that morris said in that concert back to him (laughs) which i thought was one of those hilarious but i was like man these guys are funny like so what 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 i wanted to ask too was was there um would the family sort of stuff would have been another time project do you think or was that just a direct correlation of hey morris isn't here jerome i mean uh jesse's going to do his own thing i gotta create something with the rest of the people that I got around here. Yeah, Prince had it was it was the latter. Prince had great talent around him. He had the beautiful, smart, talented Susanna Melvoin. He had the underrated Paul Peterson. Paul Peterson is a mm. monster musician. He had Eric Leeds and he had Bean, you know, Jelly Bean, and he had uh, he had Jerome from the time. So he had all these people who needed work and they they wanted work and they wanted a creative outlet. And uh, Prince was more than happy to create a new band that would allow him to express yet another side of himself with Paul and Susanna in the front. Um, it's going to be a very different band than when it was Morris and Jerome in the front. But uh, yeah, uh, the, the the time was exploding. Uh, Jesse had decided that he wanted his independence. Morris needed his independence, couldn't take it anymore. And uh, and they left. So Prince needed to do something with the pieces that were left. And it became the family. All right. Um, going into Around the World in a Day, and of course, uh, again, I I really got into Prince during Purple Rain. I, I had knew of him prior to that. But uh, at that time, music was so regional that, you know, I live in Seattle, Washington. Aside from the bigger songs, I just had no way of hearing some of the other stuff because they never played mm-hmm. it on the radio and this is per- before MTV per se so you can put a visual to it but Purple Rain of course everyone hears about that and then the expectation you know if I'm, you know, as a fan I'm like whoa okay Purple Rain is, is a monster um, I'm, I'm hearing a little you know, now I'm going back to even listening to 1999 like oh okay this is the same guy oh god you know yeah. and now I'm like I know he's about to come with, you know, this more of the same. And here comes Around the World in the Day. Uh, for you and, and in the camp and being there as it recorded, do you do you feel already like you guys know this is going to be totally different or 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 was it just like we're just doing more songs? You know, it doesn't doesn't seem that different, but maybe one or two of the songs may be different. I'm just curious because uh so listening back to some of the stuff now, I'm like, it isn't that different from Purple Rain. But then on mm-hmm. one hand, putting in the expectations of what I saw on Purple Rain, yeah, it 
it, it is pretty different. But I'm curious what you guys thought. Yeah. Creating this. In the life cycle of creativity, um, some people have a very very big circle and others have a very small one and uh they say of many artists that they've only really got one album in them just as they say of some authors well he or she only had one book in her uh, meaning that that's all the creativity they had prince knew that he was in it for the long haul i mean that he, because purple rain was so successful it was clear that he was going to be an important artist and he was going to make a lot of albums that he'd be doing this for decades it's pretty clear that his contract was going to get renewed so when you're in that position when you know you're going to be making many more albums after you hit a peak you can do what nature does you can start to cycle back around so you hit the reset button after your creative peak so you can start again. Mm. That's what Around the World in a Day was. It was a restarting his career from a new perspective. He, uh, the journey that took him from his first album all the way up to Purple Rain, six albums, culminated with the ultimate expression for him of who he was. He had now... At Purple Rain, he had his band. He had the revolution. He had this color scheme, the color purple. Mm -hmm. He had a look, which he experimented with on Dirty Mind, but he refined it with the trench coats and all that. And it got better and better, and it reached its peak at Purple Rain. When it came time to reset his artistic look, the very first thing he did was to write songs that reflected a larger us. We, songs like America, about his country, and uh, Paisley Park, about this place where us, where we are. Mm -hmm. And if you recall the album cover around the world today, it's all the colors of the rainbow. Mm -hmm. It's blue and green and red and yellow and orange. So he's now taking this big world view. It's not about him anymore. It's about an us. So he, he restarted and he... Uh, put out songs on that album that are saying, okay, this is this new us. There's this Paisley Park that's coming. And this is what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Um, that was harder to do than it was to say. So on the record that followed that, which was um, Around the World, uh, rather uh, Under the Cherry Moon, the Parade album, mm -hmm. um, he, he reset it from an artistic perspective, just like he did with Dirty Mind, which was black and white, he went back to black and white and took a very artistic mm. perspective on the parade record. So um, Around the World a Day is a transitional album, but it has some, as a transitional album, it's got some amazing works of art on it. Condition of the Heart is one of my all-time favorites. Mm -hmm. That is a stunning piece of, piece of music, just stunning. Yes, it is. Um... Wow, yeah, that album was, and, you, and I'm glad you brought up the whole thing about the look, um, because that was such a strong part. To, to me, it was, they went hand in hand. I mean, it was like, yeah, I want to hear the music, but then he looks totally different. You know, I remember when the uh, Raspberry Beret video came out, and I was shocked. I was like, whoa, you know, hairstyle's different. It is so colorful. It was almost like the album cover came to life. Mm. Uh, on the screen and I was just like wow and it was hard. it was you know it was challenging because it was again that purple rain visual of Prince was so heavy at that time and was so strong and, and we already had the uh, you know the movie had already been on home home release so we could watch mm. that over and over and to see that new Prince I actually if I want to remember correctly didn't uh I was going to say that Raspberry Beret video came out. Uh, and then the next thing that we saw, and again, I didn't see any live concerts, but the next thing we saw was the America video. But at this point, Prince had already transitioned into the Christopher Tracy sort of look and was already <laughs> making the movie. Uh, and again, seeing him again there, I was like, who is this guy? <laughs> You know, yeah. It's cool, but I was like, God, he's already on something totally different. And it was just amazing because I was like, wow, okay. Uh, this guy, is he's moving, man. And it was, it was just like 
to sit back and watch it. And then it just became cool to see the different looks. Um, but going into that parade stuff, I wanted to, to go back to the family for a second. Um, it, the music sort of changes in terms of, you know, the textures of it a little bit, too. Now you're really incorporating uh, Eric Leeds mm-hmm. uh, in, into the mix. Um, it's not as drum machine all the time. Like there's mm-hmm. live drum playing again on some of this stuff. What was the, do you remember sort of a distinct difference of, okay, I want to start recording this family stuff. And, and was that all just him aside from Eric or did somebody else play on that with him? Or? Um, that was uh, pretty much, it was, it was just Prince. Uh, Bobby Z contributed the song River Run Dry. Okay. And that was uh, Prince sent that out to Claire Fisher out in Los Angeles. To, and that was the beginning of his collaboration with Claire Fisher. So he had Claire do the orchestration on that, which was just stunning. That was a, that was a good partnership. So Prince was open to, um, input from others, including Eric uh, and, and and Bobby Z, and just, he was open to input from others as to help him formulate the direction for the family. The direction for the family never ended up being as strong as his vision for the time. Uh, it, you know, the family is still together. They're touring as F Deluxe now, is mm-hmm. what they're called. But yeah, they're still making music together. Remember also that there was right around the time of the parade album, there was also Madhouse. Yes. Madhouse, another one of his vehicles. They did a couple of Madhouse albums, and they were a vehicle for Prince and Eric to do instrumental stuff. Did Did you record um, that as well? I did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, gotta, I, did. I, did, I have to ask you about that. The first, did the first one. Uh, the second one, I was out in Los Angeles working on. Um, the post-production for the Sign of the Times movie, and Prince was at home in the newly opened Paisley Park, and he was working with a new engineer at that time. I was still his employee, of course, but I was working for him out out in L.A. on the Sign of the Times concert. I wanted to say something about what you were just talking about, about Prince's change of direction and your Mm -hmm. impression, like, wow, this is a whole new guy. There are two things about Prince that I think we don't talk about often enough. Um, The we kind of gloss over sometimes. I think people often forget how much of a true artist mm. this guy was. Uh, we had a um, we had this, the revolution shows at First Avenue back in on, on Labor Day, and I got reacquainted with some of my old Prince colleagues. And Roy Bennett, his Prince's lighting director, was there. The great Roy Bennett. And Roy said that. He said, you know, people forget that Prince's favorite movie was David Lynch's Eraserhead. Mm. Prince was an artist. And artists don't view themselves necessarily as a commercial product, first and foremost. Prince, it's not like he arrived at this notion of the motorcycle and the purple and the hair and the hoop earring and he says okay i've done it i've created this perfect product now i'm just going to be this product forever Mm -hmm. that's not how he thought he was an artist he was constantly exploring who he was musically and artistically and as a man as a human being he, he he was changing his hair and wearing glasses one year and not wearing glasses the next Mm -hmm. just to satisfy, to scratch the itch of being an artist. Now, that's one thing. The other thing that people forget about Prince is that the thing he was probably best at is being a pop craftsman. Mm -hmm. He uh, was great at funk. He was great at funk. He he was great and a great musician, but um, he was never as funky, I would say, and I'll bet he would say too, Never as funky as Sly Stone. And he was never James Brown. He was like Sly in that he really did have a genius for melody. And when Prince was doing things like Pop Life and Raspberry Beret, there's there's the whiff of funk in them. But those are just straight up pop songs. And they would not have been out of place had they been written by Lennon and McCartney. Uh, he's, He's a pop writer. It's interesting you brought up Sly because I, I, I'm a huge Sly fan. And to me, I see a lot of Sly in what I tend to think of as some of these like from 86 
through uh, you know eighty seven. A lot of that sign of the times, Dream Factory stuff to me reminds me such of the sly type of sensibility. Yes, uh, I know. think I think they were the same type of musician. To use Prince's words, Prince once said that Sheila E. and Jesse Johnson were the same kind of musician. I think Prince and Sly were the same kind. Uh, when you listen to their work, you hear where their strengths are. Uh, and I, I've been a, a Sly fan since I was a little girl. Uh, it's it's melody for one thing. Those unforgettable, incredible melody, uh, a gift for being a great band leader, a gift for finding talent. Like Sly found Larry Graham and Cynthia and Rose, all these great people, and brought them in. Prince had an ear for talent as well. Uh, and, and a social conscience. Um, it's Sly could write songs like Stand and, and just move you so deeply and uh, a, a generosity of spirit, uh, a kind of wisdom, an open-mindedness. I think there were many, many qualities that Sly and Prince had in common. I, th- I think they're very similar. Um, just to go back to the sort of the, the look of Prince and, and, and you know, being an artist, uh, and you brought up like when you had the glasses, like I know – uh, when he came into the sort of that peach and black phase of sign of times it was, again it was so fascinating to me just because i was like this is a whole new thing and you could see it was so detail driven you know it's like the clothing the hair the the shoes uh the instruments the color of the instruments the stage lineup it, it almost went you know and even the of course the album covers and the center art of the uh, vinyl, you know, was so detailed. You know, one of the big things as a fan, you know, I would love going to Tower Records. Mm. And just there was the cassette versions and there was the vinyl <laughs> album. But even the cassettes, I was like, I know there's a certain way that the font is here. And he would pick different. Fo- you know, I, I would imagine his had a hand in all of that. I mean, just to like yeah. everything had to be a certain way. And most cats... Don't go that far, you know, it's just like right. turn the album in and I'm done, you know, but it was like such details. And I, and I, and I hope that as we kind of really look back at this, that we can see like, wow, he was very much all in, you know, like everything was such a, a, a part of it. Even the recordings, as you would know, it seems like there was little things thrown in there uh, that were like Easter eggs or. You know, listening now when you hear some of the unreleased stuff, I can hear where, oh, this song on this album actually was connected to, you know, that other song on another previous album and had no idea. You know, you can hear the segue sort of match a little bit. Um, but one, oh, you, you brought up Madhouse. Mm. Uh, and I love that first Madhouse record. His drum playing on that, to me, it was badass. I was just like, in the pocket you know, I know when I hear him playing, I was like, I love his style of play. Um, I do too. But that recording of that album, like, I heard that you guys did that in, in a week or something like that. Is any truth to that? Or we did it <laughs> probably less than a week. Wow. Uh, we had we had been in Europe. We had been in the south of France. We'd been gone such a long time. He couldn't wait to get home. He couldn't wait to get home and make this record. So uh, he we just banged it out. It was in. Uh, his new home on Galpin Road, you know, this, he gave the old Kiowa Trail house to his dad and moved into a new house just just up the street in Chanhassen. And there was a bigger studio, a really nice studio with a control room and a separate ISO booth uh, downstairs, again, in the basement level of this beautiful new home. So we could have live drums set up in, in this room all the time. And, uh, it, and the piano was just upstairs. And it was really easy to, to work there. Beautiful, beautiful room. And we worked nonstop and just cranked out those songs. And he just gave each one the title of just being a number. So it was just <laughs> recorded sequentially, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, all the way up. It wasn't true jazz in as we understand jazz, it was, it was more like funk because you know how those jazz drummers, they've got that light wrist and jazz drumming is just a separate thing on its own. Prince was not a jazz drummer. He was more of a funk pop drummer, but it sure was fun to do. We really had a good time. We made it really, really fast. Wow. That, um, and, and can you speak on the process too? Because, you know, I've heard the story of like, um, when you were recording, uh, uh, the parade, and my understanding is, you know, he just came in there, 
jumped on the drum set and like did the first three or four songs in a row. Mm -hmm. Yeah. T talk to me about like, is he literally, does he, is he playing to a click track or is he just playing his own time and just doing <laughs> it? Or <laughs> this is amazing he, to me. I don't... Yeah. He's, he's playing to music in his head. Wow. Uh, th that's how the parade album started. It was at sunset sound in Los Angeles and Peggy McCreary was, uh, she later became Peggy Leonard was a assistant engineer at Sunset. Prince loved working with her. And so when we worked at Sunset, it would be Peggy and me and, and Prince. And it was great. But he told us, put up fresh tape. And then he said, don't stop the tape in between songs. He said, keep it rolling. I'm just going to go one, two, three, four. And uh, we started off that way. We ended up having to cut some things up and change some things around. But that's at least how it started. Typically, I said it earlier, he would do one of two things. He'd either come in and start with the drum machine, if it was a dance song, really just, just program the drums, the old Lynn LM1 drum machine, and play the drum machine. I'd have the bass and the guitars and the keyboards all tuned and ready to go, just sitting around him. When he was done with the drum machine, I'd hand him the bass, he'd play the bass part. When he was done with that, he would uh, put on the guitars or the keyboard parts. Now, as, he's, as we're striping the drum machine part, if we're going to have a breakdown, if the snare's gonna go away, we could just mute the send that fed the tape machine. So he could just reach over and hit the, he could be you know, kind of counting the bars or singing the song in his head and reach over and mute the snare live if wow. he wanted to, or just stripe the whole thing and we come back and we erase the parts that we want to erase later. Anyway, that's he would do it one instrument at a time with the drum machine until he was about halfway through. He put on his lead vocal, the backing vocals, and then we would finish up and add the additional overdubs. The other way he would sometimes work is uh, he'd come in with lyrics already written. And let's say if it were going to be um, acoustic drums, he would take the lyrics and he would tape them to a stand, a mic stand, right in front of the drum kit. And then he would just play the drums. I would record them and he would play the entire song kind of singing the lyrics in his head. Wow. Uh, an incredibly gifted arranger who understood song structure so well that he could create it piecemeal without a blueprint and without circling back. Sometimes he would circle back, but rarely. I mean, he usually had the song pretty much in his head as he sat down to create it. I've never, I've never seen anyone else work like that. No one else I've ever encountered. And I was in the studio making records for 22 years, and I saw some brilliant people. I worked with Greg Kirsten. Greg is nominated for the third time. He's nominated for a Grammy for Producer of the Year. He did the most recent Adele album. And um, Greg and I did three records together back when Greg was the Geggy of Geggy Ta. Greg Kirsten's a monster. I've seen great, great, great artists. I've worked with David Byrne and with Tricky and with, with of course, Bare Naked Ladies and these really successful people. But nobody works the way Prince worked. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, it's, the guy was music, man. It's just like seeping yeah. through him or something. <laughs> yeah. In, in his own words, those kinds of cars don't pass you every day. Uh, he was an extraordinary, extraordinary person. Um, can you speak a little bit about, and, and you know, it seems during this period, you know, of like 84, 85 on through, there was so much work being done and, and projects. Uh, so the Dream Factory, there's the Dream Factory, which I believe sort of morphs into Crystal Ball, which, of course, becomes Sign of the Times. Mm. But initially, that Dream Factory project, let me say, for me, looking at that and seeing what the track was seeing, that, that would have been a monster album. Like, I don't. I don't understand why it didn't come out, but how does it, for you, how does that process start? Like, do you guys, do you guys finish that and sort of have like, here's what that would be. And then, you know, I understand the thing with Wendy and Lisa happens. Uh, what, what do you remember about that period? You know, it starts every album back then started with a view a, a view. What a view of himself. And that becomes a worldview. The artist considers, what do I want people to think about me now? What aspect of my life do I want to put out there? So I had spoken earlier of how Around the World Today was kind of a, there's an us. There's, mm -hmm. We're a tribe now. And that 
Parade was perhaps a return to uh, his artistic, really pure artistic roots, taking it back to the black and white era. Sign of the Times, you can tell from the cover, represented a little bit more of a dark period um, because the revolution had disbanded and Sheila E. was in his life now and Susanna was in his life, but she wasn't going to be there much longer. He was going through, he was going through some difficulties. So to answer your question, um, Dream Factory uh, was kind of, it seemed like what he was feeling, what he was trying to do at that time was uh, search for the perspective and the view of himself that he wanted to put out there. So you'll put a record, write a bunch of songs, put a record together, and then he would have doubts about it. The most famous example is the Black Album. Mm -hmm. where he put a record together and then just went, oh, wait, 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 I don't necessarily want people seeing me that way. So his life was shifting. Uh, a major part of his life concerned uh, Wendy and Lisa and Susanna. They, they, were, he was, they were a big part of his personal life, of his musical life. They were huge to him. And, and of course, Bobby Z, his friend since high school, so as this landscape is shifting beneath him, he's changing his mind about what he wants to share. At the same time, um, he put together a triple album and Warner Brothers said no. It would be really, really expensive to release a triple album. Um, he had peaked with Purple Rain and he'd sold 25 million or something, but at this point, they recognized that's unlikely to happen again. And sales for Around the World in a Day and for Parade really fell down at that point. So they said to him, no, 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 you know, even though you're still a platinum art artist, you're selling millions, we're not letting you put out a triple album because there's not enough profit in it. So that, I, I think, stung him. Uh, his label didn't tell him no very often. They said yes to him when he was 23 years old and he asked mm -hmm. permission to make a movie. So this guy wasn't used to hearing no, but this was a really firm no. So... Um, Dream Factory, Crystal Ball, and then ultimately Sign of the Times happened as he was going through some personal and artistic and professional changes. Sign of the Times is where he landed. And it, it happily for all of us, it's considered a, a masterpiece. Yeah, you know, you know, and I when I hear a song like Crystal Ball, though, I mean, I remember hearing that. You know, the first time I heard it was like a bootleg or something, and I, and I was just like, I can't imagine how this is not. I, I was just like, no, it just seems so amazing to me. Like I was like, this song is bananas. Like man, yeah, you know, it was such but, a know, landscape of music or something. It's what you want. The artist has to consider what you want people to know about you. Sure. We've seen when that's not carefully managed is when artists break down. Mm -hmm. Kanye West is apparently, I, I know very little about what's going on with him, but apparently there's something going on that is so rough <laughs> right. that the poor man was hospitalized over it. And uh, if you see the documentary Amy and you mm -hmm. see Amy Winehouse, you see exactly what happens when the artist cannot effectively create an artistic persona that is separate and distinct from a personal psyche. If you let that public version of yourself become your psyche it, it, it's dangerous it it can take your life in the case of amy winehouse it can it can it can hurt you so an artist has to carefully decide how much of themselves they want the public to know um crystal ball reflected difficulties that Prince was going through with Susanna. Uh, he, as fans know, he and Susanna were engaged, mm -hmm. and then the engagement broke off. And they were kind of, they, they had a long run, a long run. And when you're considering a person who may become your wife, become your spouse, and you're going to be with forever, and then you decide to call that off, it, it was difficult. It was difficult. I think while, while Crystal Ball was true of Prince, certainly true, he was a 
very honest songwriter. He didn't necessarily want people to know that truth about him. And mm. he turned his personal dilemmas and woes and fears, most famously with the song Wally. Uh, he, 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 he set that aside. He put all that stuff in the vault. Instead, what he wrote about were fears that all of us shared. Sign of the Times, the song, is about the rise of, of drug use and gang violence and our fears of, for our future. So he wrote about, about the bigger picture. He wrote The Cross and he wrote, he wrote straight up love songs like um, Adore mm -hmm. uh, to, to put a more positive spin on life and, uh, and have the negative spin be the big picture, not directed inward at himself. Would you say that was, uh, you know, another song that, you know, I look at the original version of it, it's like, man, it was probably his most personal, from my understanding, would be like Old Friends for Sale, like like that original version of that. Like, yeah. And which is an awesome song, <laughs> like just mm -hmm. musically, lyrically, it would have been unlike anything that, the you know, we would have heard at that time. But then I'm like, wow, he's really talking about people around him in the situation and when you, the way you're bringing this up it's like i can see how yeah some of these songs may be too personal and that's it's, it's not not a bad thing about prince but there's one thing i kind of wish that uh sometimes we did get more uh, an understanding of him in the music because sometimes his music like you said it can speak for everybody or uh, sometimes I feel like his lyrics sometimes get a little overly clever. Like mm -hmm. I think he may be referencing thing, referencing things, but you really got to pay attention uh, and get it. And sometimes there's songs like this. And I was like, this would be an honest sort of bear all, all songs. But again, I'm speaking as an outsider. I'm not bearing my soul. So I can understand how that might be. Uh, that's a hard thing to do. Uh, even going back to the black album, uh, yeah. I can understand how maybe some of the themes and things going on in that album, he might have been like, "Yeah, I don't know if that's a, the thing to do." But it's interesting that he would—he's able to pull pull it back at such a late stage of the game. Like, right, those things are pressed up, mm. uh, ready to go. And I don't know how much you want to get, to get into this. And I've read other things and stuff. But what is what can you say about that that black album? You know, that night at Paisley Park, like, was he just really? going through a traumatic situation or was, you know, what, what was going on at that? I can't say too much sure. about it because I only know, uh, not because I don't want to be candid, but because I only know part of the story. Um, I was no longer working for him when he made the decision to release the Black Album and then okay. when he made the next decision to not release it. So I don't, I, I don't know that. I was there for the recording of the songs. All the songs on that album I recorded with the exception of one of them. Um, they, those songs, that collection of songs was never intended to be on an album. It was just stuff we did for fun. Uh, Sheila E. had a birthday coming up. If I remember correctly, it might have been December 3rd. And I might not be remembering correctly. But we were out in L.A. and we had been working on Sign of the Times. And uh, when, when we would do parties, um, you could go up the street, if you're at Sunset Sound, you could go up the street to Grundman Mastering and you could have your recordings mastered onto just an acetate. It was a piece of plastic, essentially, that would play on your turntable just like a record would play. So we stopped what we were doing in the Sign of the Times record and just did a bunch of fun stuff. We did some of it at Sunset Sound. Other pieces like La Grind and Cindy C uh, were done at the home studio, but whatever. We had a collection of songs that would be fun to dance to at this big party that Prince was throwing in Los Angeles for Sheila E.'s birthday. So we pressed up this stuff, and we danced to it, and that's what it was for. When Sign of the Times came out, Prince had anticipated that he would start to get his core audience back, and that he would start to get more play, more airplay on um, R&B soul radio stations, and in, in the on the R&B charts that he'd have more he'd have more hits there, and that didn't happen. He had now effectively crossed over into the pop charts, and his music wasn't being played as much as it had been in the early days on R&B and soul radio. I mentioned KACE and KJLH in Los Angeles; mm -hmm. they weren't as big of Prince fans as they had been in the early days. And uh, I believe that that was a bit of a shock to him and a disappointment. 
uh, he straight up said that the song Adore was, he was saying, they're going to be playing this on Soul Radio. And I'm not sure. I, I, I don't think that happened to the extent that he thought it would. Right. So anyway, he wanted to say to the press, I'm still funky. I'm going to release this Black album. And then he changed his mind. He was going through some changes right around then. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, in terms of him, you know, getting the, the, the Black audience back or whatever, there are songs on there that I think can achieve that. But I think, too, you know, the video wasn't there. You know, I know like mm-hmm. Housequake was released, but there was no video. I, I, Adore, again, there's no video. I don't know if it was actually an official uh, single. But uh, even, uh, you know, of course, Girlfriend, if I was your girlfriend, you know, there's yeah. no, no no video for that. So it's like, as much as we love those songs, it was like, yo, this is that. I, mean, I remember my dad at that point was an older head, you know, was deep into music. Even he, I remember he had the album was like, yeah, this... You know, I'm, excuse my language. Like, yeah, this nigga's back now. You know, I mean, he was. Yeah. You know, what I'm saying, yeah. like, but it was like we never got to see it, and of course, the tour didn't come to America. So it was like, kind of like, yeah, he's got those songs, but of course, as you know, hip hop is sort of really yeah. starting to gather yes. its strength, and sort of things shifted. So it's kind of like the things we did see. It was still that, you know, kind of weird. Prince it was like, yeah, you know what I mean. Know. The funny thing happened is you just mentioned it. Uh, the handwriting was on the wall. Rap and hip hop were coming up hard. Yeah. Every artist who is really, really successful must feel how shocking it is to ride the crest of a wave of popularity and fame and commercial success and your pictures on the magazines and you're great, great, great. And next thing you know, you hear a noise behind you and you turn around and you look and, oh, it's just, you know, that foamy sea. Oh, that's no big deal. Next time you turn around and look, it's a wave and it's a bigger wave than you. Yeah. And it's you're going to crash on the beach and it's going to take you out. And by 1987, it was clear that wave that's behind you behind you funk i'm speaking to funk here the wave that is behind funk is coming and it's bigger and sure enough that wave has been one of the biggest we've ever seen in popular music Mm -hmm. Um, rap and hip-hop have had a long run they have dominated the charts for decades who knows what's coming next Uh, some people probably do i don't but whatever it is um it 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 always happens that's that's just that's history right Um, Prince must have been aware that his life was changing, his personal life, and that uh, Purple Rain wasn't going to come around again for him in that way. And that's got to cause every artist a moment's pause. Uh, I was sitting around with some producers one day in the studio, and uh, we started talking about who's had a long run. I mean, really, objectively speaking, who's had a long run. And one of the people I was with said, you know, Stevie Wonder did something unprecedented. Stevie Wonder had five great albums in a row. Nobody has five great albums in a row. I remember, I don't remember which year it was, but there was someone who got up to accept a Grammy for Album of the Year and then the thank you speech. The first thing this person says was, I'd like to thank Stevie Wonder for not making a record this year. <laughs> <laughs> like Stevie had a long run. It doesn't go longer than that. Prince had a hell of a run there, um, I think starting with Dirty Mind. Um, but, but yeah, that, I, yeah, he must have been feeling all those things. He was a smart guy, so he knew what was coming. Yeah, it's, um, what I was going to say, too, is, oh, so, okay, Sign of the Times. Uh, you said you were working uh, uh, post-production on the, the movie, the audio or the soundtrack of the movie? Yes. Um, that that movie was amazing. Let me let me tell you that I, I had no way of knowing as I was watching it that they weren't. I mean, it was a live recording, but I would just assume like that staged it was live. So it was fascinating to see like that was actually they were you know performing to those to those vocals, and then you can kind of and now hearing it, you can hear like they even there's like it's not like there's a lot of audience or other overdub vocals in that. Yeah. 
now. Movie? Unfortunately, it was a very last minute. It was a bit of a mess. Um, it, the last dates we had on that Sign of the Times tour were in the Netherlands. And <laughs> Prince called me the day we arrived. I believe it was in Rotterdam. Maybe, no, it was Amsterdam. We arrived in Amsterdam. And he called me in the afternoon and he said he he was getting he was going to do a movie. He said, and I'm going to get you know this film crew is coming, and we need a mobile truck. You need to get us a mobile truck right away, and we're going to record these next couple of concerts at Rotterdam, and it needs to be perfect. And the phrase he used was, "It needs to be perfect, or heads will roll." <laughs> so, I, yeah. So I had to uh, make some phone calls to Germany and get the truck out there immediately, and uh, with no pre-production, we just shot these two concerts. Then we brought the tapes home to Minneapolis, and that's when his creative mind started working, and he wanted to add some new stuff. So that's when, in our brand new facility, Paisley Park, the doors are open now, he wanted to hang concert lights in PA, and he wanted to uh, bring in a crowd, a local crowd, and record those guys, and then have, <laughs> have this audience that may number, I don't know, 200 people maximum, have them sound like the... 8,000 people <laughs> in this arena in Rotterdam. So it was really hard to uh, make those disparate pieces all fit together. We did it, but I haven't, I haven't been able to bring myself to listen to that concert because it, it's 30 <laughs> years old now, and I'm just cringing when I uh. remember how difficult it was. But friends have told me that it is truly, those, those shows were great, and that yeah. it, it's worth seeing. It's uh there there is a uh, uh in Japan uh, at the Tower Records in Japan there is actually a box set version Blu-ray of that movie uh mm. you should check that out it's got like booklets and stuff in there and I watched the it looks amazing it sounds amazing you guys did a great mm. great job on that definitely um oh you know a lot of people have always I've heard you talk about you know the mistakes some of the the, the mistakes that turn into great things during recording. Uh, like if I was your girlfriend, but I was curious, what, what comes first? Is the the Camille voice, does that happen before uh, the girlfriend song or is that afterwards? You know what I'm saying? You know, that voice it was something he was doing um, when I joined him in 83, particularly, he was definitely doing it with guitar. I don't remember if he was really doing it with voice, but with guitar, uh, you change the speed of the tape machine, record it at one speed, and then play it back at, a, at another speed. A classic example is Erotic City. Mm -hmm. And you get this, that changes the timbre of the instrument. So, uh, Oh, real quick, would that be the, uh, on the song Hello? And it's like the guitar is just like crazy, like... Yeah, Fast. I was wondering, like, how did he do that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just just uh, switch the speed of the machine. So uh, if you're running at 30 inches per second, which is normally what we did, you switch it down to 15. So it's at half speed. Everything is just an octave down, so that you don't have to retune your guitar or anything. Uh, play the part, and then you record it at the low speed, and then when you play it back at the high speed, you know, it just sounds it sounds chipmunky. But uh, it doesn't have to be an octave. You can use the very speed function on a tape machine, and you can you just have the speed be anything you want. So you can take it down just a few semitones uh, if you want, or up the other way. We also had a new box at, at that time, something called the Publison Infernal Machine. And the Publison would do pitch shifting like a tape machine. And without any appreciable delay. It was a great, great box. Loved that thing. And so we were able to get the Bob George voice <laughs> okay. and able to get the Camille voice pretty easily, either using the tape machine very speed or just using the Publis on. Wow. What, uh, speaking of tape, and I assume you guys recorded to like two inch tape, right? When you do mix them down to like one inch or a quarter inch tape or something? A half, half inch. Half inch, yeah. okay. We mixed down okay. to half inch. Quarter inch was a little bit too small. He was doing quarter inch before I arrived, but the standard in the early 80s quickly became the half inch. So that's what we mixed to. And this Still is something. this is the time when you literally had to have your blade like and you're and you cutting, splicing oh. tape and <laughs> putting them together. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we, we cut up tape, especially if we will print a long version of a mix, and then we'll print a second long version of it, which I would then cut down to be the album version, and then it could cut it down even further. We could have a third version that was the single version, 
um, because singles were typically shorter than four minutes. You'd want to want to aim for about three three minutes for a single. Wow. What? Um, just jumping ahead, I, and I, real quick, let me ask this because uh, probably the other half of the questions that some of our listeners ask, and you mentioned the song earlier, was the song Wally. Uh, mm. A lot of people dying to hear that song, but when you were recording that, without going into sort of like lyric specifics or anything of that nature, I mean, I, my understanding is a very personal song uh, at the time. And then did he just like was like, nah, scratch that. I don't want to do it. Or did he have you destroy it? Or yeah, yeah, it was. Uh... Um, Susanna had just left. She had, it was finally over and, um, <clears throat> they had gone back and forth, but it was finally over. The engagement was over and she moved back to Los Angeles. So I knew that he was in pain. It was pretty easy to tell, but he, Prince didn't like to admit any weakness. He didn't like to feel sorry for himself. You had mentioned old friends for sale. Uh, so, it's a genuine emotion that he's feeling, but he doesn't want to advertise broadly to people that he's feeling down. He, I'm going to answer your question, but just to, yeah. as a preface, let me say that this is, he was happy, generally happy and grateful to have the career that he had. While I was with him in almost five years, he never canceled a show when I was with him. He never canceled a show. He got colds and the flu like other people because he was human, but he would just take DayQuil, that cough medicine, and he'd go on stage. He, he would not, he never wanted people to feel sorry for him. Hmm. He didn't want to show weakness. He just was just, just was a strong guy. And uh, anyway, after Susanna left, he was in pain, but we were doing a lot of dance songs like Housequake and stuff like that around that time. He he wasn't he hadn't written any ballad or any self pitying track until one day when he had me come to his home, the Galpin Road house, uh, the studio there, and he had me just put up tape and he he may have left me a note or he just told me what sounds he wanted, meaning uh, if it's going to be a ballad, there's going to be big reverb, big long reverb, and he's going to want the acoustic drums and he wants the acoustic piano rather than drum machine. And this is what he wants, so I set everything up and he began recording and it was uh, amazing. It was so amazing and I have compared it publicly to Stevie Wonder's song, um, you know the song, It Ain't No Use? Hmm. Now we know the truth, it ain't no use, mm -hmm. each other we must do with that. Remember it's on fulfillingness? Go ahead now, Susan. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Go ahead, girl, get it. <laughs> I love that song so much, but if you were to print out the lyrics, you'd see that the chorus is one word, it's O. Oh. Mm. We've got to say, oh, and in the background vocals, the girls are singing, bye, 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 bye. But Stevie, the lead vocal, is just singing the word, oh, and it's just this big cry of pain in this beautiful song. Wally was similar. So it was a piano ballad, and uh, it starts with him speaking to Wally, Wally Stafford, who was a member of his band. And he's saying, Wally, where'd you get those glasses? Can I try them on? Because I'm going to a party tonight and I want to look so clean. He's kind of talking, but he breaks into a little bit of melody here. And then the story continues and he's talking to Wally and he's saying, yeah, yeah my girlfriend just left. So I'm going to, I want to meet somebody new. I want to meet somebody new. And then he goes into this melody and the, the chorus lyric is, Oh my la di da, oh my la di da. But as he's singing it, he's morphing the word, oh my malady. And he's kind of saying, my malady or my melody. Mm -hmm. And he talked about it with me afterward. He said, isn't it funny how the word melody is kind of like the word malady, meaning sick, sickness. So anyway, we finished this whole big thing, lead vocal, backing vocals, the whole business is all finished. And I'm thinking, like I always thought, but now really I'm thinking, I can't wait for people to hear this. It's so great. I love this. Wow, what a major accomplishment for him. And then he, he made his cassette and then he said, okay, now put all 24 tracks in record and erase it. And I, I was just stunned. I'd never heard him say anything like that before. And I, I you know, I asked are you kidding me? And then I argued with him about it. I said, please, please just sleep on it. Don't do this now. Just think about it. Because we'd been up, you know, 24 hours. Can we just please think about it? And he would not take no for an answer. He said, if you don't do it, I will. And he went over and put all 24 tracks 
in recording, he wiped out, destroyed that beautiful song. He destroyed it. Now, I, I believe I've heard that he may have re-recorded the song later after. I, uh, I, think, there, I think I heard somewhere through the grapevine that there might mm. be a version of that song out, out there. I don't know. Uh, he made a cassette of it. I don't know if that cassette was maybe it was lost. Maybe he made a cassette copy and gave it to someone. I have no idea. But that original version we wiped out. Wow. Yeah, people have said they've heard it, uh, a, a version of it. I don't know which, which one, but yeah, that's one of those sort of Holy Grail type songs uh, for sure you hear about. Um, you know, speaking on Prince's legacy, uh, and you know, we're at that time where that conversation is very much apparent. What do you, and I've heard you mention before, but we just got the greatest hits uh, collection just came out. They had Moonbeam uh, levels on it. Um, but in terms of, of course, there's a vault of a wealth of material. Uh, two questions. One, has that just, I want to get just d- definitive answer as far as you know. Has that stuff, the older stuff, been converted digitally? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I have spoken with people who are at Paisley Park and are responsible for um, the material in the vault. I can tell you that they uh, have a a big job to do, huge job to do, of cataloging and preserving all of this material. As they're trying to do this big job, they are being uh, buffeted by um, forces that include both Prince's family, heirs, um, his record labels, um, his uh, lawyers, his estate. There are so many moving pieces. So they're trying to do a really big job while standing on shifting sand. So, uh, and, and the people who are right there on the front lines are good people that Prince loved and trusted. So I think what we all have to do is just step back and wait, and we will get our questions answered in the fullness of time. Um, They're working on it, and it's going to be great. Uh, Prince had a lot of people around him throughout his whole career who were moral and trustworthy and responsible. And those people are, are taking care of things now, but they are, they've got a tough job to do, and there, and there are a lot of, there are, there are a lot of things at stake here. So I, I, I can tell you that. Um, the, it, it, I believe we can probably expect that we will see we're gonna we're gonna see stuff from the vault. It's going to be released at some point. I cannot tell you whether or not it's gonna be all of it. I can't tell you when. I don't. I can't tell you what the decision criteria is for deciding what to release. I can just tell you that there are. I've been in touch with people who are working on it. And it's going to be great, but we just got to be patient. Right. What, what would your preferred method, you know, let's say stuff w- was going to be re- released. Do you think, and I'm going to sort of pointedly ask this question, but should they release things uh, that sort of go together? Like, okay, let, you know, to say is, well, there was this project that they kind of was, he was kind of working on and these songs sort of go with that. Or should they just be like, hey, here's a song from 82, and here's a song from 97, and here's a song from 86, and Mm. put them... No, you know what I think I would like to see happen? I had mentioned at the start of this podcast that I think there are three important audiences. The fans, Mm -hmm. the music Mm -hmm. scholars who will analyze Prince and put his work in uh, in the context of other composers. And then there are historians when we talk about great Americans, we talk about Louis Armstrong. And uh, that's a different conversation than the music critics who talk about Louis Armstrong. So uh, of those three audiences, I think um, for the benefit of those three audiences, let me say, everything should be released. The fans want it for fun. The scholars will can have a more complete picture of who Prince was if they have everything, and the historians can paint a a more accurate picture of Prince's life when they have everything. So I think ultimately everything should be released. Uh, I think a good way to do it that I personally would really enjoy is uh, a subscription. Just Mm -hmm. like we're all very excited for the next 
season of pick your favorite TV show, but let's say it's Game of Thrones or something. You know, you just, you just can't wait. So you've got your subscription to whatever HBO, whatever it is, and then when it's time for that to be released, you get a batch of episodes that all come out. So I think it should be the same way with an artist's material. I think you should be able to buy a subscription to prints, and then once a year or once or every six months, there's a release of material that goes with your subscription, and you can binge listen, <laughs> uh, like we binge watch now. So that, that's what I'd like to see happen, and I do think it should be um, stacked in terms of the important periods of his life. So I would look at, if I were looking at his entire career, I would identify the really important windows and I would release the things that were associated with his most prolific and important and critical times. I'd do that first. You had mentioned Roadhouse Garden and Our Destiny. The, the stuff that he was doing right when he was on fire, I would, I'd, I would do those first. Um, and then I think after that, it would be really important to release the stuff after that chronologically. Who was this guy when he was 14, 15, 16 years old? Mm. Um, what were his early works like? And did they predict the kind of artist that he would become? I think that would be a good way to do it. Um, but uh, as I said, the sand is shifting underneath. Uh, who owns the rights to this material and uh, wh right. who benefits from it being released? Uh, we know who benefits, the fans and all those benefits, but who benefits financially? Technically, you mentioned um, transferring everything to digital. The, I can tell you without hesitation that older tapes, they die. Mm -hmm. and they, they've got a short shelf life. So unless tapes have been transferred to a more stable format, we'll lose them forever. That will happen. Once things are transferred to digital, however, you have to be very careful that that digital storage is not hooked up to the internet because mm -hmm. what that can do is open the gate and allow everything to be hacked and allow everything to be released. A lot of technical and financial and managerial problems associated with releasing unreleased material. Wow. Um, have you been to Paisley Park uh, since it has reopened? You know, as a, I haven't as a... yet. I've got I've got a, a visit as planned this year. I'll be going some point this year. I haven't been yet. Um, some of my colleagues went. Um, we've had a couple of PRN Prince Rogers Nelson. That was our, the organization is PRN. So we've had a few reunions, and some of my colleagues have gone and talked about how sad it was. It's going to be really powerful when I go. Um, I'm not especially eager to go. Um, I will go, but um, it's going to be it's going to be really sad that those are the formative years of my life. Um, Prince gave me my career, and uh, and and like all of us who worked for him, I loved him. I loved him. Um, he was easy to love, and he was good to me. And it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. But I am going this year. Okay. Have, have, did you um over the, after you had left Prince? Did you keep up with his musical releases in, in career? Not for too long. Uh, I loved the Love Sexy album, and I loved Musicology and um, Batman. And a few things I I listened to and enjoyed. My musical tastes changed, and uh, uh, my my professional life changed. Um, some of your listeners may know that I left the music business in 2000 and went to college as a freshman. And I have my PhD now in uh, cognitive psychology and behavioral neuroscience. So um, I changed. I always, I always loved his music, but um, I didn't follow him as ardently as many of his fans have. Okay. Did you say behavioral neuroscience? Yeah, it's wow. looking at the underpinnings of behavior. And in particular, what I look at is auditory neuroscience. I look at musicians and how musical training in childhood develops the auditory pathway. Uh, we know, uh, we know there's a boatload of evidence now that um, it's very good for little children to learn musical instruments or and or to learn a second language. Because when you're doing all that fine listening, listening to the differences in timbres and pitches, or let's say accents, you're developing an auditory pathway and an auditory cortex up in the brain that actually helps you your whole life, mm. your 
whole life, when you're old and you're in the nursing home and uh, the nurse's aide comes to you and she's speaking in a really heavy accent, the musicians will be better equipped to recognize what she's saying. It protects our hearing, it helps us cognitively, it helps us recognize patterns. Um, musical training is so good for kids. Um, just like, I mean, you're, it's, you're, be, you're becoming an auditory athlete, just like if you were playing basketball or you're playing baseball, you're becoming a you know, physical athlete with your body, or you're becoming an athlete of sound if you take music lessons. But what we don't know is what aspect of musical training confers most of the benefits. In other words, are singers the same as drummers? Uh, and are they the same as violinists? And are they the same as guitar players? So since I'm at Berkeley College of Music and I've got 4,500 musicians right outside my door, I can, I can explore those questions. Wow, fascinating, fascinating. We, we had yes, uh, yes. just spotlighted uh, a group of kids, uh, I'm going to butcher the name, Garrett College, but there's a video online of these school kids playing Prince's Less Work. Uh, full band and then we had the, the music teacher come on the show and it was pretty amazing they were so young um, but they heard the song and they were like they wanted to do it and you know the teacher was like I didn't give them any limitations you know they, they were able to play it and they were dancing it was, it was pretty fascinating to watch so cute Prince loved kids he loved children um, oh I know I just wanted to ask you just, just to go back um, because for me at that time in the 80s you know, there was, again, I, I like to uh, associate these musical pop stars with superheroes because that's kind of how I saw them. But you have Prince. You know, if Prince was Batman, you know, Michael Jackson was probably Superman. Mm. And, you know, in, in the streets with us, it was always like you, know, you either were you a Prince fan, a Michael fan, or are you both. But I'm curious, what did did Prince ever mention Michael or did you got, I, you cannot be aware of Michael Jackson at this time. Yeah. Obviously it's the, the man, but what was sort of, was there any sort of like, I don't want to say competition, but there's an awareness of each oh, other. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, there's a fellow whose name, whose name is Chris and I don't remember his last name. He interviewed me last summer for a, um, a documentary film he's making about the rivalry between Prince and Michael Jackson. Oh, wow. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, yeah, they were they were both highly aware of each other. I'll tell you, um, somebody, a respected colleague, said once about Bob Dylan. He was talking about Bob Dylan. He was saying, you know, the Beatles, the Stones, Jimi Hendrix, they all wanted to be Bob Dylan, and he didn't want to be any of them. <laughs> I think... I'm, I'm going on a limb here. But right after Prince, I um, the next record I did was with the Jacksons. So I spent mm. three months at the family home on Havenhurst in Encino, California. Michael was on tour at that time, and Michael was just building Neverland right around that time. But I spent a lot of time with Jackie and, and Jermaine and those guys, and they're really, really, really nice guys. And we got to compare notes about Prince and Michael Jackson. <laughs> oh, so wow. I will, I'm going on a limb here, but I will venture to say that Michael wanted to be Prince more than Prince wanted to be Michael. I, I, I could um, see that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think um, Prince uh, was aware of just how great Michael was. Prince was well aware, because he said it to me, of how competitive Michael was. Um, when, when Quincy Jones invited Prince to participate in We Are the World, um, Prince said that no, he said, and I was in the room, I didn't hear Quincy's side of the conversation, but I heard Prince's side because I was standing next to him, we were in the control room, and um, Prince said no, he said, I, I, don't, I don't do that, I, I don't want to do that, but can I send Sheila, and, and it was all good, it was all good. Prince was torn up in the papers the next day in right. the LA Times, but uh, that wasn't Prince's fault, a photographer tried to jump in the back of his car with him and uh, anyway that's a different story but um prince uh prince was comfortable being himself and liked the rivalry with michael i don't i don't think he felt threatened by michael at all when michael invited prince to do a duet with him on the song bad um <laughs> Prince said, no, I, you know, I'm not doing that. And he said, uh, you know, I'm just not going to 
sing. I'm not going to have a guy sing to me, your butt is mine. <laughs> right. I'm not doing it. Uh, and I, I asked Prince, why not? You know, wouldn't it be great? It'd be great for fans to have the two of you guys, mm-hmm. you know, on the same record. And Prince said, no, you know, that's just not my thing. And I said, yeah, but come on, you know, don't you guys, and I said, that was so stupid. I said, don't you guys just want to be viewed as friends? Because I had seen them together. I said, you know, don't don't you want people to know you're friends? <laughs> I'll never forget the look Prince gave me. Because <laughs> he was kind of sitting in front of me in the control room, and he just kind of turned around and he just said, don't be naive. Hilarious. He's not asking me because he wants me to be his friend. This is competition. <laughs> Don't you get it? I didn't get it, but I, I, I do now. Uh, you know, Prince Prince knew exactly what Michael was up to. It's like, come on, let me arm wrestle you and, you know, on my home turf right. with my built-in table that's going to give me the advantage so yeah there was a there was a rivalry there but i think i don't think prince was especially threatened by it not in the middle 80s in the early 80s he was there's that video clip that has made its way around Uh, uh, the james brown show where prince got on stage and um knocked over that light pole and really really (laughs) messed up badly and embarrassed himself i can tell you something when i was working with him Prince used to watch that videotape. Really? Oh, yeah. He was well aware that he had messed up. Um, uh, Jesse Johnson told me a story that after that show, the time and Prince, some Prince's band members, they were all together. I don't remember if it was in the limousine or if it was backstage, but Prince said to everyone in his circle, that was bad, wasn't it? I really messed up. That was bad. Jesse told me, Every single person said to him, no, Prince, that was great. You were great. Wow. (laughs) Jesse said to me, and Jesse was a newcomer because he wasn't from Minneapolis. He was from East St. Louis, Illinois. So Jesse didn't feel comfortable just, you know, saying, no, Prince, that was terrible. So Jesse kept quiet. But Jesse told me that he looked at Prince and he realized in that moment that Prince knew there is no one in my circle who will tell me the truth. Interesting. Yeah. And that's that's very lonely and that's very isolating when your best friends and your bandmates when you say tell me that was bad wasn't it and your friends say no no it was good you were great you know Jesse uh, and Prince again as an outsider it seemed like I, so the other conversation you know, I mentioned that we would always say there's Michael and, and Prince when Jesse had came out with his first album you know in my little area it was always the rivalry between who was better Jesse or Prince now of mm. course Prince was on a whole, whole other thing, but at the time of when that sound, Minneapolis sound, was was really popping, and Jesse came just like a lightning bolt, you know, with, with his first album, and really, you know, on a street level, was very big. And it always seemed like after that, there was like a weird sort of love hate sort of relation, you know. When I say that, because I know Jesse came out with. Um, uh, Gosh, there was that the Pepe or Pee Pee song. Um, uh, Pepe Willie. Yeah, do yourself a favor. Do yourself a yeah, favor. Yourself he a favor. came out with that, which I, you know, was based off of I guess Prince's version of that song. Mm-hmm. And then on Prince uh, on Housequake, the the twelve inch, you know, he mixes in some of Jesse's uh, song with Sly. Mm-hmm. In that, I don't know if you remember that. Mm-hmm. And then there was the song Shockadelica versus you know jesse had an album called that and so it seemed like there was like a weird kind of thing going on between those guys and i always felt like they seemed like they would be their style was so different it's so similar and i understand probably because jesse was sort of like hey i'm gonna do this minneapolis thing and, and go on but but you make it sound like they were did, did they work together i mean more than we kind of knew or were buddies or something or, or i won't say buddies but yeah, I worked with Jesse after I left Prince. I worked with Jesse, and I, I got to know him well. He befriended me, and he was so good to me um, that I always have a soft spot in my heart for Jesse. He's a good man. The thing about Jesse is that he's deeply talented and really smart. Jesse is a great guitar player. Jesse is a talented guy, but Jesse doesn't have the full palette of talents that Prince has, no one does. Uh, Prince was so intimidating to other musicians because 
you couldn't believe that any one guy could be that great on that many instruments. How can he be that great on guitar and keys and drums and songwriting and singing and lyric writing and running his company? Like, how is that possible? Mm. So you take an exceptional talent like a Jesse Johnson, a kid who can really play, and Jesse could sing and Jesse could write, Jesse had an ear for melody, and you put them in the barn with a horse that's that fast, it, it can wilt other talents, talents that we would call exceptional, mm. look puny next to Prince. So that has got to, uh, that's got to really be a psychological dilemma for people. So here you get this, this, this talent, this Jesse, and he's, uh, he has the misfortune of being in the shadow of a major, 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 one of, once in a lifetime artist. So he's got two choices. You either be judged next to this giant of an artist or you step completely far away mm. and reinvent yourself as something that's nothing like this guy. He took the former choice. Okay, well, I'll be like Prince, but I'll have a different color. It'll be pink, not purple. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just try to kind of keep up and compete on the same, on the same playing field. And that's not going to happen for anybody. Um, not for anybody. It, it's, it was difficult. It was difficult. The, the folks who, um, the talents that came up after Prince were the ones who were not like Prince. Think of the early 90s and think of uh, Tony, Tony, Tony. And think wow, of, uh, I love that. remember, oh. yeah, remember uh, Teddy Riley and all mm -hmm. that great stuff coming up in the early 90s they weren't trying to imitate prince they they just they they took hip-hop and well they took rap and they made it hip-hop and the new pop music became hip-hop music but jesse um kind of did hitch his wagon to that star the star that was the minneapolis sound then you worked on uh the every shade of love album yes and he shouts you out on that it was a love struck right? yeah, he did. <laughs> <laughs> he did. susan turn the guitar up. <laughs> yeah uh that was a great album. Oh, that was some good stuff on there. Jesse's a talented guy. Yeah, and what a guitar player. Oh. Yeah. And Prince talked about how talented Jesse was. He talked, he knew. Prince Prince was well aware of of how great Jesse was. And it was it's sad. It, it's sad for Prince, you know, when the people you love and admire, like Morris and Jesse, Wendy and Lisa, are going to compete with you. Mm. Uh, huh? Yeah, that's how it's gonna go. And, and you worked on was it the Roca? Is that how you say that album? Yeah, I did that, and then also the second album, "Are You My Baby." Ah, oh, that which uh, that satisfaction on there. Jesse was on that. Uh, yeah, that, that third album that was a that was a monster. I still still play that to this day. Uh, mm -hmm. What was that? Roca. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll have to tell them that when I see them next. Yeah, that, that's a, what musicians those two are. Oh, oh, <laughs> what musicians they are. That Wendy is amazing. And, and Lisa, of course. And they're just, they're amazing, amazing musicians. Um, we, go ahead. We had, uh, I was going to say, we had uh, Greg Wells, the record producer from L.A. Greg Wells came and visited Berkeley recently, and he said something that was interesting that you're your listeners might find interesting. He was talking to the Berkeley students in my the major where I teach music production and engineering, and he said to them something that struck a chord with me. He said, "You guys, these students," he said, "you don't realize until you see it. You don't realize how good good is. Mm. Good is really good." And we listen to records, and I've been a record listener and record lover my whole life, and we listen to them, and we sing along, we fantasize to them, and they become the story of our lives, and we bond to them, and that's a subject we could talk for hours about <laughs> music psychology and music cognition, but I can tell you, when you're in the room, and you're listening to that vocal right in front of you, or watching that guitar player, whether it's Jesse or Wendy or Prince, when you're seeing that in front of you, you recognize how good good is. Yes. It's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. It's just like professional athletes. You know, everybody plays one sport or another. Try doing it for a living. <laughs> it's yeah. different, different beast. Yeah, you, you, you just hit something right in the head. The head. I remember uh, one of the times I saw a Prince where it was more of a sort of intimate situation. And I stripped away like I was just really into this guy and the music, but to actually see like the work ethic of him and actually see him do his craft and just mm -hmm. like 
the whole lot of machine that he had with him and, and what it took, I, I had got a real appreciation for like what he's doing is on such a high level and yeah. he's actually good at it and he's like happy. It made me inspire me to do whatever I was doing. It's like, you know what? I have to have that sort of that sort of like a bar. Like you need to be feeling that feeling that he gives you when you watch mm-hmm. him physically do it is the feeling that we should get like this podcast, for instance, like I enjoy doing this so much and I try to do it to the highest ability of what I can. And I want people to feel that when they hear it, you know, and it's that feeling I see when I saw Prince, uh, when I got to go to Paisley Park, it was the same thing. I was like, wow, now I really understand, you know, it's different than just listening to that music to actually see it in motion. Yeah. It's a whole other thing. And I think that's one of the things that, will be missed about Prince because that live, we we didn't talk too much about that performance aspect of Prince Mm. to actually see him do that stuff you hear is so powerful. It's just like that, like you said, it's once in a lifetime, you know, it's. One of my friends, a great, great musician, Gegita, Greg Kirsten's partner, Tommy Jordan, was a great, great musician, taught me so much about music. He was fortunate enough to see three of Prince's 21 shows um, at the Forum in Los Angeles. Mm. This is just a few years back when he did that residency. And Tommy said something that was insightful. He saw those shows and he said, um, he said the, it was so great that the bad thing about it is that young kids in the audience might get the impression that that's all you have to do that mm. it's okay you just get on stage and you just play what you feel like playing <laughs> tommy said prince makes it look so easy mm-hmm. he might make the young kids in the audience think oh i could do that they don't realize no you can't <laughs> <laughs> no you cannot no. <laughs> oh, from piano to organ to drums to guitar to vocals that easily and be that good at them. Um, it's it, it becomes as you started by saying it becomes like a superhero. That becomes a uh, is this even how is this even possible for human beings? I suppose like watching sports or the Olympics or something. You think wow, the, the best as Tommy Jordan also says the best can do the most with the least for the longest. Hmm. Um, when you're really great. Just the smallest thing can be captivating. What, what do you think, or what you just described, and what we've been talking about this whole time, what, what do you think is, and I'm just asking for your opinion, what's the sacrifice, though, of a guy or a person being a prince on that level? You know, Because, I mean, that's a, such a, to me, there's a lot that, if you could just devote all your time to this, you know, there's still life. You know what I mean? Like, there's still... Yeah things it's, in relationships with people <laughs> and, yeah um it's harry potter it's it's the hero's journey you know mm. you, you watch those i watch those harry potter movies again uh, right around christmas and <laughs> i started to think at one point this kid would have been a psychopath <laughs> <laughs> if he had gone through all that stuff this kid would just be nuts it's it's fantasy but uh, the the great the late great Joseph Campbell, the scholar who wrote about myths, mythology. Yes, yes I, Joseph Campbell wrote that book that was hugely influential to David Bowie and Mick Jagger and Paul McCartney and all these great artists. He wrote the book The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And George he talks Lucas. About, yeah. Yes, right. He talks about the hero's journey. Mm-hmm. So when a hero. Um, whether it's Star Wars or it's Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings or whatever, throughout human history, we've had these stories about myth and archetypes. And it always involves the hero. The hero is usually a young man. He's plucked out of his environment against his will. He's usually at home minding his own business. He's plucked out of his home and he's told, you're the chosen one. You've got to go on this journey. Right. And the journey is going to be really dangerous and you might get killed. Oh, and you gotta, you know, throw the ring into the volcano or the dragon's mouth or whatever it is you're supposed to do. And no one can do it but you, and no one can do it for you. And there'll be some advisors, elder people or um, goddesses or whatever, who can help you. And they'll heal your wounds. Maybe they'll show you the map. But no one can do this but you. So you go on this hero's journey and you bell the dragon or whatever you're supposed to do. And you turn around. At some point, there's a homecoming. You come home, but you realize you're so damaged from the journey 
that you're not the person you were when you left. So Joseph Campbell talks about the writer's journey as, uh, journey as being similar to that. When a writer, if a writer is going to be so great that they can write about a universal truth, write about something that resonates with everybody, in order to do that, you've got to go to a deep place in your psyche. And that's a dangerous journey. To go deeply into your own psyche so that you go so far deep that you are no longer just you, you're every man or every woman. That takes its toll. It's a dangerous journey. Not many people can go that deep. And when you come back up, you're not really, when you go home, in other words, you're not really you anymore, are you? You're everyone. So when you create a character like a Prince or a Michael Jackson, or a Lana Del Rey or a Rihanna, that other people can project their fantasies onto, where are you in all that? Mm. You have to figure out a way to protect your psyche so that you don't die from going on this dangerous journey into your psyche so often. Some people can't handle it and they do a lot of drugs. And uh, some people just kind of flip out. We talked about Kanye West and we talked about people who, you know, they might just lose it for a minute there. So to answer your question, who was this guy and, and how did he do that? One of Prince's great geniuses is that he did this all alone. And he, he, didn't, he didn't turn to recreational drugs. He didn't get sucked into the vacuum of fame and believing his own hype. He was a very honest songwriter. He had, to the best of my knowledge, one secret. And that secret was that he was in physical pain. Mm. I said before, he didn't like admitting weakness. He was in pain from his hips. He started taking uh, pain medication to block it. And as pain medication goes, he had to keep taking more and more and more and more and more. And finally, he took so much pain medication so that he could function, so that people wouldn't know that he was hurting. And that the level of that dose is what killed him. Um, now, now, are you he, saying that this, this this pain was apparent when, when you were there, or is this... No, when, oh, not okay. when I was there. Uh, I don't know, and I'd, I'd like to find out from some of his other colleagues when it actually appeared. Uh, I don't know. Uh, to the best of my understanding, it may have been in the 90s, but I, I really don't know. Okay. I honestly don't know. And I, I kind of don't really want to know. It's It's a sad thing to think that this great man who gave us so much um, didn't you know, couldn't couldn't get help. Right. Um, that's really sad. But 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 I was not close to him at that time, so I cannot speak with any accuracy or credibility uh, about what his life was like. You know, in the '90s or, or beyond. Wow. Yeah. It's <clears throat> not to shift gears, but you know, it's almost to say some of the the, the stuff you talk about. You know, is very uh, to, 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 as a man that shows a lot of strength. Uh, you know, I can only sort of imagine, you know, you, you get some of that from your upbringing. I would imagine his father was probably a very uh, man, man's man in the sense of, you know, uh, and particularly, you know, I can speak in some, from from African-American male standpoint of what we've traditionally uh, put forth in terms of emotions and not show emotions. I could kind of see how you could get to the level of. You know, you're not going to get that proper medical like as you should. Not to say it's not available to you, but because of some of the things we have in us, we're reluctant to go to the doctor or to let certain people see certain aspects of us that would show us in a weak or needy sort of a stance. Yeah. Which, you know, for me, looking at it, I I have to take it as a a learning learning moment to say, well, you could be Prince or you could be Michael Jackson, you could be whatever, but we still got to humble ourselves a little bit, or at least I need to humble myself to like, yo, I need to go get checked out or because we not, yeah. none of us are above, you know, our mortality. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, you're, we're, what we're doing is we're answering the question, um, what do I want? Right. And um, sometimes we, I'm sure Prince was a really smart man. He knew, he knew 
that help was available to him. He he had the intellect to know, and he was smart enough to know himself and his own thought process. He would have been self-critical enough to ask himself, you know, if he says, no, I'm not going to get help, or no, I'm not going to, uh, whatever, I'm not going to get this operation. I understand that um, his the religion that he was a mm-hmm. member of prohibited him getting a blood transfusion, which essentially prohibits getting an operation because you need you need blood when you're on the operating table if it's a major operation. But anyway, he, he could have thought all that out for himself, and he made the decision to live as he lived. And now, as I understand it, it's been widely reported that he had agreed to go to get help for get, to get off pain medicine, but that it came too late. Um, it didn't help him in time. So we all make a decision of, of what we're willing to sacrifice right. to be who we are, and that that was his call. Where, where were you uh, when you heard the news of, of Prince's passing? Oh man, it was such a coincidence. It was. Um, it happened during my sabbatical. I had a sabbatical from school, and I had worked so hard. I left the music business in 2000 for the opportunity to just collect data in my lab. So I did eight years of school, four years of undergrad, four years of grad school, came straight to Berkeley. Berkeley's a teaching school, so I'm teaching, teaching, teaching all the time. Finally up for sabbatical, and I was in the middle of my sabbatical in the lab collecting data from a participant. I was happy, happy, happy. And I got a text from our media relations department that said he had passed away and that their phones were kind of lighting up and I was wanted for a comment so this that I went and I and I, I spoke with the media and did my part now as it happened we had just had Wendy and Lisa the, the week before Wendy and Lisa had been on campus and I had gotten reacquainted with them I, my old friends that I hadn't seen since the 90s and we spent a great week together wonderful week at Berkeley and we had so much fun talking about Prince and everything and they had just gone home a week before so um, it was a, it was a funny coincidence um, I'm, ha- I'm happy to serve Prince's memory I, I see that as a as a privilege I'm happy to talk with fans with everyone about what it was like to be around him because I was and always will be um, a fan Wow yeah you are uh, you know as, as we unlock you know, some of the mystery and, and, and gain some of the knowledge. I mean, you are one of the people that have that experience. And, you know, it's great that you share that uh, with us and listeners and stuff, because, you know, I was a guy who just studied the music. You know, I, it got me into music and I would just listen to those records. And like I said, look at the liner notes and I would see the names and I would be like, OK, somehow I want to learn how they did this or you know, so mm-hmm. very aware of the people and what your jobs were there and your contributions. So now to be able to finally be able to get some of this information, it, it is incredible. Um, like I said, this is a blessing for you to, to, to come on here. Mark, uh, do you have any additional uh, things you wanted to get in here? Yeah, yeah. A couple of you know, techie questions. Mike really covered everything, which was great. Uh, Susan. You're a tech person like myself and like Mike. And uh, Mike and our other partner, Big Ken, turned me on to streaming music from various sites. Now, I got into recently HD tracks. Have you heard of them? HD, high definition? Well, that's the name of the company. They're, they're called HD tracks. Okay. What they do is they have a lot of uh, music and they sell it in a FLAC format. And it's upsampled to like 2496 or 24192. Now, as an engineer, do you hear that difference in those supposedly high-resolution audio f- formats? Uh, that's a great question. I cannot speak, um, and I will not speak as an audio engineer because all the recording I ever did was all analog, but I can speak as a, as a psychoacoustician. <laughs> I can tell you most people cannot perceive the difference. It, the difference in that high resolution audio, it is objectively speaking better. And uh, there's no doubt about that. Up to a certain point, it's better. Beyond that point, the resolution is probably too small or too fine for us to really be able to make a categorical decision where we say this is better or this is worse. Does it 
Yeah, I'll ask a, just an open question. Does the high resolution audio contribute to our enjoyment of music? The answer to that is an unqualified maybe. <laughs> you can think of it you can think of it the same. It's helpful to have a visual analogy. Uh, do you need the massive big screen TV to really enjoy a movie or a sporting event or anything that you want to watch? No. You don't need it. You can watch it on your laptop. You can watch it on a small little iPad screen. There's people who watch movies on their phones, and they really enjoy it. It is, of course, objectively better when the resolution is better. But when we consume an art object, we're consuming the whole thing. And we're, when, we, when we consume music, there are two ways in which we can regard it. As a musical signal and as an acoustic signal. We're buying the music. We're not buying the acoustics. We're buying it for the music. So that's why you can be listening to a symphony on a crappy television with just one distorted little speaker. And if you're feeling it, you're feeling it. And it sounds great to you. So the answer is technically, yes, it's better. Psychologically, does it make a difference? Uh, not necessarily. You, you know, real quick, just to jump in, I, I agree with some of that because uh, when I think of some of the Prince songs that I have that are not the official, you know, releases and they're not the greatest of copies, but those are my jams. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't care how they sound, uh, you know, it's a song, large room with no light. I don't know if you remember mm -hmm. that one. I love that. That, I love that. that song is a beast to me. <laughs> and, and I know Prince went and re-recorded it and put it out, but I listened to the original because of just the feel of the recording it's not the best recording quality but i just that's what i i just love the music you know and, and, and you know what if that brings up another point uh when we consume a stimulus whether it's a movie or it's a piece of music we form a mental template a memory mm. of of that and then every piece of music you listen to after that is filtered through every piece of music you've ever heard. Uh, in November, I participated in this recording studio in Nashville called Welcome to 1979. And every November, they have the Welcome to 1979 Recording Summit. And it's a three-day event. And they feature, on Saturday night, they feature a classic album. And they bring in the engineer who did that album to talk about it. It's an audience of about 60 people. It's great. So much fun. The studio is like a throwback to 1979. So last year, the album was Purple Rain, and they invited me to come and talk about it. And we played the vinyl of Purple Rain in this control room for these 60 people, ranging in age from there were a couple of teenagers there all the way up to the old timers, like engineers who'd worked with Ike and Tina Turner and, a, wow. yeah, the, the gamut. Anyway, they told me before I arrived, they said, we took the original version of Purple Rain on vinyl and we A-B'd it with the new remastered version of Purple Rain on vinyl. And they said it was no contest. The original sounded better. But uh, I never got to hear that comparison. But the, one of the reasons why the original might have sounded better is that they had an expectancy of how it should sound. Mm -hmm. So when you're listening to something, subconsciously you're comparing it to your notion of how it should sound. And the original object is going to match that better, more easily, than the new object. Humans take a little bit of a while, we all know this, to acclimate to a new idea. A scientist said once that the human brain treats a new idea the way the human body treats a new protein. Initially, we reject it. <laughs> you know, you think of a little baby tasting a new food for the first time, and they're like, ah, I hate this. Uh, it takes a little while to get used to it. So um, we're going to prefer the old familiar. It's going to take us a minute to get used to something new and, and really, really make an accurate comparison. Um, real, real quick, Marcus. Now, just there was one thing related to this I, I forgot to ask, and you mentioned uh, it was Goodwin mastering Bernie, uh, Bernie, 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 Bernie Grudden. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask. So, I, I know sometimes the conversation with fans is when we talk about albums such as Sign of Times, uh, Parade, I think. This seems like those albums aren't as bright uh, as we would sort of like them. Um, like you could listen to Sign of Times versus Love Sexy and you can hear, very hear, you can hear a difference. Mm. And I was going to ask you, 
and that's why I was asking earlier about the final mix. You guys are you guys are mixing those songs that night. Yeah. Done. And then at some point you put together the sequencing for those albums and then you're submitting that to I would imagine Bernie's operation to mm-hmm. master that. Were you guys having any sort of uh notes going to them in terms of the mastering of how things yeah. should sound? Yeah, Prince and I went to mastering together. Uh, sometimes, sometimes he would just send me, um, but it was either the two of us or it was just me. And you go in and you listen to side A and then you listen to side B and you give Bernie your notes. You can tell him, uh, yeah, this song's a little bit quieter than the other one. Can you increase the volume on this one? Or uh, this one, I really wish the snare was louder. So uh, it's too late to remix it, but can you boost the frequencies that would give us a little bit more snare? Or on this one, the vocal's a little too loud and so forth. So you go in with your notes and you tweak the bass to get it just right. Um we went to Bernie, Michael Jackson went to Bernie as well. He was just considered the absolute best for dance music at that time. And it's really mm-hmm. tricky to get bass just right on vinyl because if, um, if, if the bass is too hot, it's going to pop the needle out of the groove and it's, it's going to be really bad. But you want that bass to be really pumping. So Bernie knew how to, how to do that right. But then when CDs came along, we no longer had that problem. So now you had to do two mastering sessions, one for vinyl and then a different EQ curve for CDs. Um, really? so the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you don't have the physical constraints with CDs that you had with vinyl. So the, going to be it's going to be eq'd differently on cd um we didn't in the early early days of cd we didn't do that we just made the cd off of whatever the eq was for vinyl <laughs> mm. so it didn't necessarily sound so good um but yeah that, that that that's how we did it and our sound was constantly evolving i was not an experienced engineer. I was a technician when I joined Prince, so I really didn't know what I was doing. But as I was going along, I was developing an ear. And um, as one time I said to Prince, you know, can we use automation? You know, everybody else is using automation. Can we, you know, try to sound like everybody else? And he said to me, no, (laughs) we don't want to sound like everybody else. That's what's good about us is that we don't sound like everybody else. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, we sound worse. (laughs) But (laughs) yeah, we don't get that right. We don't sound like everybody else. But he he was okay with it. I just has you ever have you ever been approached about remixing those original albums that you worked on? Has there ever been a discussion about? No, uh, nobody has. Uh, mm. They haven't, and um, I have had some conversations with Warner Brothers uh, about. We're, we've been talking, but they haven't asked me to do any mixing or anything like that. I wouldn't because I left it a long time ago. But I would sure as hell, sure as hell love to serve as a consultant Consultant. because uh at least for music released during that period you know i couldn't Mm -hmm. speak about prince's ear in the 90s or beyond but during that period i knew what he liked oh i knew it really really well because he was so vocal about what he liked and i knew what he hated because he was really vocal about that too Mm -hmm. Uh, that became my mental template his ear became mine out of necessity i was his hands serving his vision so i i can say something about what he liked okay. have you been were you approached at all for this uh the purple rain uh re-release thing that they're talking about doing yeah and they want to keep all of that sure. pretty quiet right now but i have been i have been in communication with them and i'm doing some work uh okay. listening to to some tracks um say just, no more you know, there's, a bunch, <laughs> there's a bunch of us i'm not the only one there's a bunch of us but we are uh, Warner Brothers is taking this really seriously, and they're trying really hard to serve fans. And um, Good. they're talking Good. to a lot of people to put out something that's going to be great. Okay, that's all I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> say no that's more. Really say, and that's really all I can say. But yeah, it, it's going to be great. <laughs> okay, cool. Because I'm like, yeah, we need that. We need that pop. And so if they they contacted you, then I'm good. Then I then I yeah. I trust that. All right, um, uh, go ahead, Mark. My bad, man. No, 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 no. You you hit it on, hit it on the head. Um, Susan, uh, we talked about a lot of people you've worked with that have been in the Purple Circle. Uh, what was it like working with uh, Candy Dolfer on her album? Uh, it was was great for me. It was a great privilege. Uh, she, I mixed her record at Westlake Audio. I um, 
I admired her skill. She's not the same musician as Eric Leeds, uh, but she she was lovely, and I, I enjoyed working with her. At that time, after I left Prince, I needed to develop my own sound, and that took me a bit of time. It really took me a bit of time because I was just so accustomed at sculpting sound to serve Prince. And the first few clients that I got wanted that sound, so we were all good. But the only problem was that, that his was the only sound I knew. And by his admission and mine, it wasn't as good as what other engineers were doing. So I really had, I was working with Candy at a time where I was really struggling to find my own ear, a competitive ear. So I'm, yeah, it was it was good. I, I would ultimately go on to become a better engineer than when I worked with her. All right. Um, last couple questions. Uh, were you also uh, the engineer or tech during rehearsals? Uh, like mm, with the yeah, tours and stuff? I, yeah, I was his full-time employee, oh, okay. so wherever wherever he went is where I went, um, technically, musically. If we were in the studio, I was his engineer. When we were on tour, I was his uh, tech for the drum setup, the drum machine setup, and um, I would mix frequently mix the after parties. I would, mm -hmm. uh, Cubby wasn't always with us for the after parties. Uh, whenever we had a mobile truck, which we did a lot, a mobile recording truck in some of the major cities, I would record the live shows. Uh, whatever, I was on the movie sets uh, for Under the Cherry Moon and for Purple Rain. Wherever he need, wherever he was, he was generally making music and that meant that he needed his audio technician there. So uh, we were pretty much joined at the hip. Yeah. Do you remember of any musical performances that were done for Purple Rain, the movie, that were not in the movie, and the same would go to Under the Cherry Moon? Um, we did a lot. Uh, well, Purple, uh, I would say I would say no for Purple Rain because it was pretty well mapped out. He was working with a director, and uh, Al. Meg Magnoli? Magnoli? <laughs> yeah. It sounds like you, Mike. I know. <laughs> <laughs> he was working with the director, oh, right. and it was mapped out. So we were creating pieces that were that were featured in the movie, as well as incidental music, like Wednesday. Remember mm. that? I've heard of it. I have not heard the song. Yeah, that Jill Jones sings in the movie. Yes. It's, it's really sweet. Um, so we were just cranking those things out. And same thing on Under the Cherry Moon. Uh, we there were the songs that were featured in the movie, and that had to be well planned out in advance so that you could you know you could feature it in the script and everything. But then the incidental music we would make at Sunset Sound, meaning the cues that would tie scenes together, uh, were all just we were banging those things out at Sunset Sound and then getting it right over to the sound stage where it was put into the movie. So the mm. movies were pretty well scripted. Okay. Um, the tours were not. So when Prince was rehearsing the set list for a tour, that was great. That was so much fun because, as you can imagine, we're at the warehouse or then later at Paisley Park, and he's going through all of his material with the right. band and, and, and figuring out the sequence of songs on stage and uh, how songs are going to segue one into the other and how the, whole, the arc of the whole set. That was really creative and really, really fun for me. Really fun. Are, are you uh, aware? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mark. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Are, are you aware, Susan, of the breadth of material that is out there in, in regards to, let's say, the rehearsals in terms of that stuff that's out there and the live shows and all that stuff? Yeah, if you if you start small and, and work big, if you were to look at all of the studio record, all of the recorded material that was not live studio material essentially new songs let's say mm -hmm. i think i've said because i've been asked this before that for every released officially released songs not counting bootlegs there might be 1.5 or maybe two unreleased for everything that's been released I, i'm not that's a big ballpark figure but if you add up all the live shows and throw in there all the live shows we recorded it's it goes up by an order of magnitude because he records a lot of live shows. If you throw in rehearsal, it goes <laughs> by another order of magnitude. Because, <laughs> I mean, he he Prince used to uh, we'd set up video cameras, we'd videotape rehearsal at the warehouse. Oh boy! Um, 
<laughs> yep, because and Krenz would make his band watch it. So not only would they rehearse for eight, six or eight hours, he'd make them watch it because he wanted to see the band develop, as he called it, their camera face. <laughs> and when Paisley Park was built, he insisted on having the, the smaller of the two rehearsal rooms, not the big sound stage, but the actual thing we called the rehearsal room, had mirrors all on one wall. So that, just like a dance studio, so that the, the band can be rehearsing facing mirrors to see what they look like to an audience. So Prince documented everything, and um, there's, 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 it's, it's, it's invaluable. I would think that the stuff that the fans would really like to see, given that we live in the modern era of videos now, people think of music as having a visual correlate. I think people would be really interested in seeing those live shows and if, if it could be found, um, even rehearsals. You'd be watching a genius at work. Yeah, I, I have a, a little birdie told me that they found those tapes mm. uh, at the park and they are amazing. And you're right, everything was taped, those rehearsals, <clears throat> video. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge amount of material. All right. Wow. Uh, we could go on for uh, ages, but I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, this was fun. I really appreciate being asked, and it's a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, let me ask you guys a question. You asked me this question. Let me ask it back. As fans, what would you like to see? What are you most curious about out of that vault? I'll let Mark start. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> For me, it, it, it's a twofold answer. Uh, a lot of it would be performances that, you know, have have not been officially released, shall we say. And the other would be things like Roadhouse Garden, Our Destiny, and I would like them to be released as he did them. I mean, it would be, I know a lot of people want to come in. A lot of your producers of the day, oh, I want to come in and put my spin on it. No, no, I want what's there. I want it. To, from the tape to my ear, just so I can ingest it all. Yeah. Good, good. And I'm glad to hear that answer. What do you think, Mike? Uh, I, I echo it a little bit. I just, I would want, uh, it's tough because as a hardcore kind of fan, we do have some of the bootlegs that we know about, but I know there's mm -hmm. a ton of other stuff that we've never heard. And of course, how do they know this to what to put out? So I would personally want them to release like uh purple rain for instance but i want them to put all of the songs that were associated with that period mm -hmm. and i would yeah. want the uncut version of the song so if there mm -hmm. would be like say purple rain they could say well here's the album version here's the album as you know it and then maybe disc two is those songs uncut yeah uh with the b-sides and here was a few other unreleased songs that went with that period that you didn't hear. And for good measure, throw in the, um, the, the incidental movie music that you hear that was so iconic to us. Now, I have the bootleg version of that, but I would love to hear a proper release yeah. of that movie music, too. I thought it was fantastic. So I would want stuff done like that. So each album could be the album as you know it but then for the historian here's the other insulary stuff that you know he, yeah. he was going to go in this direction and maybe he didn't go in that direction uh and just all of the albums be available to mm -hmm. the public you know there's a lot of great the jill jones album uh, you know the eric mm -hmm. Leeds stuff all of the madhouse albums i wish those would just be available they don't even have to touch them just put them out so that people can yeah. hear the stuff that's that's what yeah, i want yeah. Now, let me ask you a hypothetical question. Let's imagine that there were some unfinished titles in the vault. And usually if it was unfinished, it meant the prince didn't like it, really. Because <laughs> he would always finish stuff, but from that period anyway. Let's say that there's just some unfinished stuff that he just never took around the corner. Would you like to see the unfinished stuff that might be just rhythm track and, I don't know, maybe it's got a vocal on it or not, uh, released unfinished or would you rather see it finished by let's say Wendy and Lisa or finished by uh, Eric Leeds or finished by Questlove or uh, finished by, by somebody nope leave it alone no <laughs> don't, leave it alone. <laughs> no if it's finished however he left it that's oh, okay. I would love to hear it. There, there are some great uh you know I don't go too deep into it but there's a there's a thing called studio nights it's like a four or five disc set came out many years ago but it goes in chronological order it has his you know uh, boombox tapes of Prince 
early mm-hmm. home demos and it goes from before he got signed his first album different mixes of the tracks and some of them aren't finished but that sort of historical sort of thing so even if they don't sound the best quality just yeah. leave it that because it just shows the journey you know it shows yeah. the process so i don't want i don't want is and i respect wendy elisa eric lee's all, mm-hmm. all of them but unless it's the 19 uh if it, unless it's the, the 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 Eric Lee's that was alive when that song was recorded, and you can go back in time and get him to add it to it, mm-hmm. then no, just leave it the way it is. You know, I, I'm with you on that one. I'm with you both on that one. But again, let's think about this. If there's something that's from that time period that uh, Wendy and Lisa were working on with with him, for instance, and it never got finished for whatever reason. No, I, I would be okay with someone who was actually there at that time having an idea of what, you know, could be on there. Mm. See, the only thing I would say to that, and again, I respect these guys are heroes to me. I love Wendy and Lisa, the first three albums. Th- those are my joints. But their musicianship and skill set is totally different than it was back then. So it would mm. just, to me, sound different. It would be the same as if Prince was alive and he had tapes from dirty mind and you took a 2016 musician prince i wouldn't want him adding parts to mm, those yeah. old because he's, a, he's a, such yeah. a different player different position, you know I mean? right. yeah see back then in those days wendy and lisa were the and eric those were the musicians that he trusted so completely he would just give them a song and uh, he'd leave and leave us in the studio and say put stuff on it and not even give them any direction because he trusted them so much. So a lot of what you hear, perfect example is the string arrangement on Raspberry Beret. That's Lisa. She wrote that part Mm -hmm. and and, and horn arrangements and things. Sometimes Prince gave Eric directions. Another time he just left me and Eric in the studio and said, finish it and put, put horns on it. So their musical minds were represented with him back in those days, but you're absolutely right. They're different musicians now, just as, uh, you know, you're going to be a different artist. So, yeah, I, I I like the idea of just releasing it the way it is so that, like, as you say, so we get to see the journey and we it helps us answer the question of who was this guy? Yeah. That's yeah. what we want to know. There is a, a, a great uh, Sly Stone release. I think it came out a year ago or so. And I wasn't around when the heyday of Sly, but I became a huge fan of it. So Mm -hmm. everything that I have is sort of backtracked, you know, uh, releases. But I tried to listen to the stuff in context to get an understanding of it. But one of these newer releases, it had like his really older stuff and some of different versions of songs that we knew. And there were different takes on it. And I love that they just put it out. They didn't have, you know, they didn't get Sly or got somebody else to add it. It just put it out the way it was and you, nice. again and I wasn't even around at that time but it gave me a better understanding of like oh, okay I see he was he was doing this on this song or you know what I mean and I love that because yeah. it just preserves yeah. the history of it yeah Sly was my guy when I was a kid um, other many kids were, were into the Beatles but there was something about him he just got me I've got to check that out I, I just adore him yeah he's a, he's amazing like I said to me uh, Prince got me into looking into Sly because I, I don't know what it was something. You know what it was? There was, uh, there was a, uh, I think it's the picture of Sly that's on the back or the inside of Riot going on, and he's like mm-hmm. on stage or something. Yeah. And I saw that picture and it was like I was like that's Purple Rain, like just oh. the look of it. You know what I mean? His hair and the clothes yes. and, and I was like, oh. He was- coolest guy and he just had when you'd see him on uh you'd see him on soul train or you'd see him on those dance shows and he'd get on stage and he just was a band leader and he was cool he looked cool and he he um you could just tell he had these great musicians and he was doing what prince did which is let your great musicians Mm -hmm. be great Mm -hmm. and 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 he he liked working with women, you know. It was a, it was an eclectic mix of people. Um, yeah, I, I think Prince owes probably more to him than than James Brown. I think he's much mm. more similar to Sly. But then we know there's always, always Stevie. Stevie was the influence that um, he was kind of a bar that 
that's as high as the bar gets. Stevie right. is is a living legend and as great as great gets. I, I wanted to ask you, because you brought up Quest Love, and, and I know he is a, a huge Prince uh, fan, mm-hmm. uh, and somebody that does a lot of great stuff. Have you uh, ever been approached, or or have you worked with uh, such guys like uh, Rafael Sadiq or D'Angelo or? No, I love those guys. I have their records and I, I love their work. Um, but no, I was just leaving the music business in 2000. Um, oh. The crew that snatched me up as an independent was mostly the alternative indie folks. Okay. And um, I I wanted a different career for myself. I was a big Anita Baker fan and I wanted mm. Barney Prince's career. Oh, I wanted desperately to be making those records. But they never asked me. So you had to go to the party that invites you. And it was the alternative indie crowd that invited me. So that's what I did. And, and I did well with it. But Wendy works quite a lot with um with yes. Raphael, works with D'Angelo and, and works with Questlove. So uh, Wendy is in the mix there. There was a, speaking of Wendy, there's a cool video I see making its rounds online, uh, Wendy doing a session with George Michael. Mm. Uh, very interesting. She's playing guitar. And she's sitting on a control, control board and doing a guitar part. Oh, that girl. When, when, you, when you see her play, oh, she's really something. She really is. Definitely. She really is. And you know who else is, too, is Andre, Andre Simone. Yes, he's been on the show many times. He is amazing, definitely. And well, you worked I, on, uh, did you work on one of his? Uh, no, no, I, I met him for the first time, uh-huh. really, um, back when it was back in uh, Labor Day, September, the, those First Avenue shows okay. I got to know him. He's amazing, that guy. He's yeah. amazing. He's, yeah. he's got a lot of star power, a lot of charisma. Great, great yes. player. Yes, I, I told him, I said, man, I saw the pictures of you from those performances. You were like the, it seemed like you were just channeling that whole energy, that thing that Prince had, and you you, you guys both have it. Uh, oh, it yeah. Like a and, he, he yeah. Look, and he looks 35. Yeah. <laughs> he's, got, he's got a 35-year-old son, and I'd be hard-pressed to tell which one was the dad. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's amazing. Uh, last question. For you, what's your favorite Prince album? Oh, goodness. It's like saying, you know, who's your asking who's your favorite kid? <laughs> you know, because I, I love that work. I love the work that we did. I, um, You know, when you put yourself into something, what does that mean? It means you're putting so much mental effort and so much of the energy of your body it takes a lot of energy to stay up for 24 hours, 48 hours, sleep for a few hours, come back again. You get so deep into it, you can't tell where it be, you, where you end and it begins. It becomes like this 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 thing that I'm grappling with right now. This is just what we're doing. This is life itself. So I, I never looked at my work analytically during that time. And, and consequently, I didn't even form the same sorts of memories that some of my colleagues do. I never stepped back from my work enough to say, oh, this is this, this is that. Hmm. It was so me. I wouldn't do that any more than you would stare at your hands and go, oh, wow, look at that thing. <laughs> it, just, it just was <laughs> me is what it felt like, my, my part in it. So to ask which one is my favorite, it would be, I think, literally, impossible to answer but there are tracks that just that killed me then and kill me now and i mentioned um a condition of the heart oh my god computer blue and beautiful ones and uh and girls and boys and another lover hole in your head and sign of the times and the cross and just so so many pieces that just knocked me out that were my favorites then and they're my favorites now that that's of the time when i worked with him and there were other favorite pieces okay. stuff b- both before me and after me uh dirty mind if i had to pick a favorite album i might even say dirty mind just because of what a seismic sea change that mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. in art and music when that came along that was just mind-blowing what a record what a great record well was there is there a song that we may not know that stands out to you that you remember. I'm, uh, yeah, I've been asked that. Uh, Torre asked me a year ago, nearly a year ago, what song would I like to see released? And I said, Moonbeam Levels. And uh, that one does, I think of the unreleased material. That one really stood out. Um, I would put that high on that list. All right. 
Well, Susan Rogers, thank you so much for being a guest and sharing your experience and knowledge with us. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for asking me. Thank you to all you fans listening. Thank you for being fans and keeping Prince's memory alive. Uh, fans are the are the blood of the music business. They circulate through the music business. The music business wouldn't exist without fans. So true indeed and and uh, if anyone wanted to reach you online or find more information about you is there like a website or something they can go to i don't have a website no uh i i'm at berkeley college of music in boston and that's berkeley uh-huh. with two e's on the end not the berkeley on the west coast but the one on the east coast uh so you can always look at berkeley and you can see what i teach and uh and find me that way all right, we can enroll. We can sign up for some classes. <laughs> uh, real quick, do, 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 do students come up to you and do they know who you are? Like, you work with Prince. Like, do they ask you questions? Oh, my gosh. It makes me sad to say that um, I don't, I, not, that, not that many of them do. No, mm. the, a lot of the younger generation, these guys are, they come to Berkeley as musicians and um, they're focused on their instrument and they're focused on being good players and uh i don't know that not many of them are are too into prince i think that's going to change i i think i think his stature is going to continue to grow in the coming years but uh we've got some great teachers we have so many great teachers at berkeley that i think i'm not that big of a deal but i'm valued so i think it's just about right I, i think it will change i think uh you know, as you know, the legacy and then the music is going to get out there, and uh, people are going to be like, oh, "Okay, and, you know, I didn't know it was like that." And, Wait, you the one on that song? And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> well, they're the youth of today, so it's their world for sure. Uh, yeah. It's their musical world, and we'll see what they're going to do with it. But I have great optimism. I think they're doing great stuff. All great. right, big, yeah. sexy, and sax. So, where, where can they find you? Uh, you know, I mean, the same places uh, on Twitter, Big Sexy and Sack, and on Facebook under my name, Mark Wiggins. All right. And you can always find me at Podcast Juice on Twitter. And of course, the website is podcastjuice.net. You can also find us at uh, princepodcast.com and on Twitter at M Dean. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed this. This was a master class today, damn it. This was, woo! You got to listen to this a couple times to soak it all in. And, and a shout out to all of our listeners who submitted questions. Shout out to all listeners who uh, continue to trip, contribute and donate to the show. And shout out to Prince. I wouldn't even be here without, uh, you know, the career and the music and just the love of, of this stuff, man. And we're going to keep it going. Uh, we're going to continue to celebrate Prince. And with that, as I always say, work it like a job. We'll see you next time. Peace. Turn me inside out what's inside.